Hey guys, what's up? This is Umar Khan and I welcome you to a new section here on this course on Advanced C++ and in this section we are going to be covering a very interesting topic that is namespace in C++. Now this is basically going to be the content which we are going to be covering in this section. So first we are going to start on with the introduction to namespaces. Then we are going to see the relation between classes and namespaces. Then we are going to see that how you can basically access a namespace. Then we are going to study about nested namespaces. Then we are going to see that how you can create an alias name for a namespace. And then finally we are going to study about inline namespaces. So if I tell you this is a very important and a very interesting topic and it is a topic that is most often neglected by many programmers. So I suggest that you stick on to this section because this is such an important topic in C++ to learn. So thank you so much for now. In the next tutorial we are going to start on with the introduction to namespaces. So bye bye till then. Hey guys, what's up? This is Umar Khan and I welcome you to the very first tutorial on namespaces in C++. So as I told you that in this tutorial we are going to be covering the introduction to namespaces and we are going to be covering some basic examples for how basically this works. So consider a situation when we have for example let's say two persons that have the very same name in the very same class. So whenever we need to differentiate between them definitely we would have to use some additional information along with their name like for example where they live for example what is their father name what is their mother name or we are going to add some information that is actually going to distinguish between those two individuals for example if we have two people that have the na name Jack then for example one has the name Jack Reacher and then let's say the second one has the name as let's say Jack Row. Then what we are going to do is that we are going to call one as Reacher let's say and let's say call the other one as Joe. So this is basically some distinction of the second name. So there has to be added some distinction that is to distinguish between those two individuals. So same situation can arise in your C++ applications as well where you have to declare two variables that are going to have the very same name. For example, one is an integer value and let's say one is a double value. Then you know that it is going to generate an error. So to solve that error, basically C++ has a feature that is namespaces and that is going to solve your error. So if you just move on to the compiler and let me show you that how it is going to generate error. So for example in this main function you have let's say a variable x that is equal to let's say 2. So now if you just see out this x it is going to work perfectly fine you know that. Let's just run it and you can see that it worked perfectly but for example we have a double value that is also from the name x and b let's say declare it to 3 and then c out x. So now you know that it is going to generate an error as you can see right here that it says conflicting declaration of double x previously declaration as int x. So this is the situation where namespaces come in to help and solve such errors. Now. In each scope, a name can only represent a single entity. So there cannot be two variables with the same name in the same scope. So using namespaces, what we are going to do is that we are going to create two variables or member, member function that are going to have the same name. So for example, let's just create a namespace right in here. Let's just remove this stuff from here and let's just write in namespace 
then you have to write in the name of uh, the namespace you are going to use for example we use the name as w then what we are going to do is that we are going to specify the brackets and in these brackets you can basically define this variable x equal to let's say 10 this time so now to basically use this int x equal to 10 and you can see that we have this int x equal to 2 because if you run this code you can see right here that it has actually printed out this variable that is the local variable to this main function that is int x equal to 2 so now what if you want to access this int x equal to 10 so what you are going to do is that you are going to see out and then you are going to write the name of the namespace which you are going to access that is named as w and then you are going to specify two columns and then you are going to write in the name of the variable and finally we are going to add a line space so if you now just run this code so you can see right here that we have this 10 as well which has been printed from this statement first you have to write the name of the namespace because this is actually the name of the namespace this is a built-in word and then in right in these brackets you have to actually provide the definition in which you can declare variables or you can do anything else so basically what's going on in here is that this namespace w has basically created a new namespace for example if you just consider the very same example of a class what it has done is that it has basically created a new class in which we have one jack here and then one jack is present in this class so now the conflict is over if you call in this x that is if you call in this jack then this jack is going to reply to you and if you call in this jack that is the local jack basically this is going to reply to you so if you talk in a more programming sense this int x that is equal to 10 is a part of this namespace and then, then this int x equal to 2 is a part of this local main function so if we talk about the definition and creation of namespaces namespaces basically allow us to group named entities that otherwise would have global scope into narrower scopes giving them namespace scopes this allows organizing the elements of a program into different logical scopes referred to by the names so if you talk some points about what is a namespace basically so first namespace is a feature that is added in only c++ it is not present in the c language Secondly, a namespace is a declarative region that provides a scope to the identifiers that can be names of the type, functions, variables, and anything else inside it. Third, multiple namespace blocks with the same name are allowed. All declarations within those blocks are declared in the named scope. So basically, a namespace definitions begin with the keyword that is namespace, as you can see right in here. Then it is followed by the namespace. I think I've just written it on the slides as well. Yes, right in here. This is the syntax for using your namespaces. First, you have to write in the built-in keyword that is namespace. Then you have to use the name of the namespace, which can be anything. You can just write in anything you want in here. And then you have to write in anything here because this is the scope that is all for the code declaration where X and Y are basically discussed declared in the namespace name scope that is whatever is written here so namespace declarations appear only at global scope namespace declaration can be nested within other namespaces as well moreover namespaces declarations don't have access specifiers that are public or private moreover like uh, right in here if you can see that we have actually now a single namespace that is named as w and then you also have this namespace as well but you can also create multiple namespaces as well for example if i just write in here using the very same syntax that is namespace then you have to write in the name of the namespace that is let's say y and in here i write in int x equal to let's say 5. so now we have actually three namespaces that is first is this w namespace then this we have this y and then we have this local namespace as well so if you want to access the namespace that is named as y what you're going to do is you're going to write in the name of the namespace then you're going to write the variable which you want to print and you're going to write in and 
So if you just run it, you can see that we have a five here on our output screens as well. So this was, I guess, all about namespaces in C++ introduction. You have seen how multiple namespaces can be created in C++. So I guess that's it with this tutorial. In the next tutorial, we are going to see what is the relation basically between classes and namespaces and how you can actually declare namespaces in the class. So that's it with this tutorial. Thank you so much guys for watching and I'll see you guys in the next tutorial. Hey guys, what's up? This is Umar Khan and I welcome you to another tutorial on namespaces in C++. In this tutorial, we are going to see the relation between classes and namespace and to elaborate the word relation, I actually mean that how we can actually initialize classes in a namespace, how you can only declare a class in a namespace and then give its definition outside. This is basically the content we are going to be covering in this tutorial. We are going to create classes inside a namespace. We are also going to create classes outside the namespace. And then we are going to at the very end cover a very small topic that is how you can declare methods outside namespace after actually initializing or declaring them inside. So let's move on to our editor because I guess there is nothing much to speak about this stuff. So the first thing is that how you can basically declare and initialize and do everything about a class in a namespace. So first what you have to do is that you have to create a namespace and let's say the name of the namespace is W and then in this namespace what you have to do is that you have to create a class for example the name of the class is let's say X. This is the body of our class and this also has to add a colon at the end. And now in this class, let's say we have a public method that is, let's say, white display. And what it's going to do is that it's going to simply see out inside the namespace. So right here in the main function, what we are going to do is that we are going to create an object. Now how an object for a class within a namespace is going to be created. First, you have to write in the name of the namespace. In this case, the name of the namespace is W. So you're going to write in W, then two columns, and then you are going to write in the name of the class that is X. Then you have to add a space, and then you have to write in the object which you want to create. And then for example, if you want to, let's say, call this function that is the void display function that must be identified something like this. So if you want to call this display function, what you have to do is that you have to use this object because now we are into the namespace. We have created an object of the class X that is in the namespace W. So now what you have to do is that you have to simply write an object dot display. And finally, if you want to add this statement as well, it is very good. And now if you just run this code, you can see that we have the output that says inside the namespace you. So you have seen that how we have actually accessed a class that is inside a namespace. Now, if I just talk about the previous case, which we were discussing in the, introdu in the, in the introduction tutorial, that we can have multiple variables of the very same name. So for example, if you want to declare this class X again, you can declare it outside the namespace that is class X and then you can do anything right in here. For example, if you just run this code, you are going to see that it is going to run perfectly. It is going to generate no error. For example, let's just create an object of this class as well. So just write in X and let's name it as O and let's just run it. And you can see right here that it ran perfectly and it generated the same output. So you can create actually multiple classes, one inside one namespace and one inside another namespace. This is actually the global scope This in this case. So now to the second part of the tutorial that says that how you can declare a class outside the namespace. So for that, what you have to do is that you have to first declare the class because we have already this class right in here that is the class X in the global scope so in this global scope you cannot initialize or declare sorry not 
use another class that is outside so what you have to do is that you have to actually I will just remove this from here and what you have to do is that you have to write in this class x right in here and let's say we want to give its implementation outside this namespace you can give it but what you have to do is that you are going to write in class then you have to write in the name of the namespace for which this class is going to be defined and then you have to write in the name of the function because if you don't write this thing over here then it is going to generate error because we already have a class x in this global scope now by writing this what you are going to refer is that you are going to refer that this class x belong to basically this namespace and when you don't write this with this class x then you are referring to the global scope that this class belong to the global scope and this belong to the namespace that is named as w so now in here we are going to do the very same stuff that is public and let's say the function is the very same that is the display function and in the body what we are going to do is that we are going to simply see out and now we are going to write in outside the namespace because this implementation has been given outside the name of the namespace that was named as w it is going to be display and we already have an object to this class let's just run it so you can see it generated the very same output but this time it says outside the namespace because this implementation is done outside the namespace we all we only have declared the class here but the defining of the class is outside the namespace we still have our class x in here in the global scope where we have actually provided the implementation but it is not going to generate error because this class x is in a different scope and this class x is in a different scope now to talk about the last part of this tutorial that how you can actually define methods outside the namespace so if you consider this very same example and let's say we have a function right here that is void display and we have actually only declared that function in over here and then in this class x what we have is that we also have a public method that is white display and also we have not provided an implementation of this class right here in the namespace w as well so now right down here in this class w x or whatever stuff is written in here what we are going to do is that we are going to actually define our method so to define a method of a namespace outside the namespace what you have to do is that first you have to write in void over here then you have to write in the name of the namespace that is w in this case and then you have to just remove it from here and then what you have to do is that you have to write in the name of the class and then you have to write in the name of the function let's just remove it from here All right, so I repeat it again. First, you have to define the return type of the function. Then you have to write in the name of the namespace to which this function belongs. Then you have to write in the name of the class to which this function belongs. And then you have to write in the name of the function. So in this function, you are going to do, what you're going to do is that first you are going to just remove this from here because it is a function now and a colon is not expected at the end so what you're going to do is that you're going to simply see out this is the class display function and now you have another function right in here that is the void display function also in this namespace that is not in this class so to define that function what you have to do is that you are going to again write in the return type since now we are not dealing with the class function so we are going to write in only the name of the namespace and then we have to call in the display function and in this display function we are going to write in namespace function outside the class since this is the name this is the function of the very same 
namespace that is named as w but it is actually outside the class as you can see right in here we have two display functions one is a part of the class that is this function and we have one more function in this namespace that is named by the very same name but it is outside this class so to provide the implementation of this display function that is inside the namespace as well as inside the class you have to write in and refer to both the namespace and the class as well but when you are dealing with this display function that is not inside the class and only inside the namespace you only have to deal with the namespace and you only have to write in w colon colon display and then you can just provide its implementation right in here now in the main function let's just remove this object you have seen the purpose of it that it is not going to generate error so let's just remove it now what you're going to do is that you are going to in the very same way create an object of the x class and then you are going to now call in the display function now to call in the display function of the class the, of sorry the function that is inside the class what you have to do is that you have to actually use in this object so you're going to write an object or display the very same way now to call the second function that is outside that is the namespace function that is outside the class what you have to do is that you have to write in the name of the namespace and then you have to simply write in the function which you want to call in so let's just run it yes we forgot to provide this here at the end and yes i've spotted one more error we, we forgot to provide the brackets for the function and right here as well and let's just segment it right down here and i guess that's perfect so let's just run it so as you can see the first output is that it says this is the class display function and the second output says that namespace function outside the class so first the class display function has been has been called because we called it using the object and then secondly we call in the function that was also only inside the namespace not inside the class so you have seen now in this tutorial that how you can actually define a class inside and outside the namespace but when you have to declare it outside what you have to do is you have to first declare it inside and then provide its implementation outside that namespace and secondly you have also seen that how by only declaring a function inside a namespace you can access it, access it outside so we have covered good stuff of examples as well so i guess that's it with this tutorial thank you so much guys for watching and i'll see you guys in the next tutorial hey guys what's up this is umar khan and i welcome you to another tutorial on namespaces in c++ in this tutorial we are going to see that how you can extend a namespace and how unnamed namespaces are used in C++. So we are going to start on with namespaces having different names and this part have already been covered in the introduction tutorial. Let me just give you a very quick example for how this is implemented. Now I'm talking about the case when we just declare in two namespaces first with the name of W and then we have a namespace with let's say a name uh, of, of that is of the name y then as you can see right here now we have two namespaces for example we have a variable x that is equal to 10 in this namespace and then we have a variable x that is equal to 2 in this namespace so if you want to access any of this x for example if you want to access this x that is in this w namespace what you have to do is that you have to write in w and then you have to write in x and in the same way if you want to access the the x variable of the y namespace then you have to write in y and call an x so this is going to just do your job and if you just write in endl in here and run this code you can see right here that 10 and 2 are printed in the very same sequence they were called in so we have already covered this in very detail in the introduction tutorial so to move on to the part which we are going to be covering in this tutorial is how you can extend a namespace and how you can basically use unnamed namespaces in c++ so starting on with extending namespaces 
Now, what do I mean by extending namespaces? Extending namespaces mean that using the very same name twice for a very same namespace. Now, let's see, for example, we have this, let's say namespace W and I also name this namespace to be W as well. So as you can see right here, that we have this namespace w and then this namespace w in which we have the very same variable int x equal to 10 and int x equal to 2. So if you just run this code, so since these are going to be of the very same namespace, so this scenario is going to generate an error. As you can see right here, it says that it was pre previously defined here. Now the purpose to show you this error was that as you can see right here, that these have been declared separately this namespace is declared separately and this namespace is declared separately but when you use the very same name for a namespace w it is basically extending a namespace and these two are basically a single namespace that have the name of w so if you use the very same variable int x equal to 10 and int x, int x equal to 2 and write in here what it's going to do is that it's going to simply generate an error message for you so you can use here for example you can use in here y and when you then write in here y and run this code it is going to run perfectly this is the very same scenario for example you define int x equal to 10 and then int y equals to 2 so this is the very same case right in here since as you can see right here that these two that is int x equal to 10 and int y equal to 2 they are in the same namespace that is the local main local main function these they have a local scope basically these two variables so in this case this variable x and this variable y also have the very same namespace so they are going to be of the same scope that is named as w so I hope it is clear. So now moving on to unnamed names, namespaces. By unnamed namespaces, I mean that you do not specify the name of the namespace. Let me just give you a quick example. For example, if I just remove this name from here, this is basically calling a namespace that has no name. So if you just remove this stuff from here and you also remove this from here, since it now does not belong to w let's just remove this as well and remove this as well so you can see right here that we have a namespace that has got no name and in that namespace we have a variable x that is equal to 10 and in the main function we have c out x without specifying the namespace so if you just run it you can still see that it printed out 10 because it has access to a namespace that is unnamed. Now, for example, you define a variable x equal to 2 here and now run this code. So you are going to see that it is now printing 2. Now, why is this stuff going on right in here? Now, if you declare a variable in the scope where you are printing it without specifying the namespace since it does not have a name, so the priority is going to be for the variable that is declared in that very scope since in this case, the cout_x statement is actually in this main function that is the that is local for this main function. So when this int x is declared in this local main function what it's going to do is that it's going to this uh, cout statement is going to give a priority to, to this int x equal to 2 and print out the value of x as 2 but if it is not present here then this namespace that is int x equal to 10 is going to be given a priority now what if for example we have let's say int x equal to 3 right in here in the global scope so if you now just run it, it is going to generate an error because this namespace also declared this x equal to 10. As I told you before that in the introduction tutorial that namespaces have a global scope. So basically if you don't specify a name here, it is going to be a global scope of this very same namespace in which this program is going on. That is a single namespace for this entire program. But since here it was local, so 
this x was global and this x is local that was int x equal to 2 this is local so it does not generate an error and it printed out 2 for us but when you write an int x equal to 3 in the global scope and since this int x equal to 10 is also in the global scope and also it does not have a name which means that it is a part of this namespace in which this x equal to 3 is present so that is the default actually global scope of this program so this x equal to 10 is also in the default global scope since it does not have a name so this is a contradiction that is x equal to 10 and x equal to 3 so this statement have to be removed from here and now if you just comment it out this statement right in here that is the global that is the default i must say default global namespace of this program is going to run and it's going to print out 10 for us so i hope it is clear so that's it with this tutorial as well thank you so much guys for watching and i'll see you guys in the next tutorial hey guys what's up this is umar khan and i welcome you to another tutorial on namespaces in c in this tutorial we are going to be covering about accessing namespace so basically there are two ways to access a namespace the first one is the normal way and then we have a directive way as well so let me just give you a quick example of how you can access a namespace by using the normal way which we have already covered in our previous tutorials but there i haven't told you that this is actually the normal way so for example we have a namespace named as a and in this we have a variable x equal to 10 and now if you just write in c out and first write the name of the namespace sorry that is going to be a and then we have to write in this x over here and then n line so this is basically the normal way of accessing a namespace so if you just run you know that 10 is going to be printed out on your output screens so this is basically the normal way of doing it now the second way is by the using directive way now you can actually avoid prepending of namespace with the using namespace directive this directive tells the compiler that the subsequent code is making use of the names in the specified namespace the namespace is thus implied as let's say a main function that is going to actually direct your code so how this is going to be done let's just see an example of this so we will define a function in this namespace let's name it as white func and in this function what we are going to do is that we are going to simply have a cout statement and in this we are going to print out namespace number one which means that we are also going to add more namespaces so outside here we are going to specify a second namespace and you to make you understand this concept initializing two namespaces is very essential and why you are going to just learn in a moment so we have the second namespace in which for example we have the very same function and in this we are going to see out namespace number two all right now if you just move on to this main function now you know that if you have to call this function then you have to write in this b and then this colon colon and then you have to write in func and this function is going to be called in and if you want to call the function that is right here at the top and you have to write in this a over here so for example we want this thing not to be written here and if you want to call the function of let's say this namespace b by just doing this then how this is going to be done this is basically going to be done using this stuff over here that we were discussing that is using directive way so let's just remove it from here we do not have to specify the c out over here because we have already used the c out statement here and since it is returning nothing so c out statement would have generated an error for us so what we are going to do right above this main function is that we are going to write in using which is a built-in keyword then you have to write in name space which is again a built-in word and then you have to write in the name of the namespace for which you want to run this main function so i want to run it for this b and then i have to specify this over here and then we have this main function and which we are going to simply call this and this and l not here for sure and i guess that's it if you now just run this code you can see right here that it printed out namespace 2 because 
this main function basically now ran for this namespace if i just specify this a over here that is the first namespace right here at the top that also has a function that print out namespace number one so if you now just run this code you can see right here that it printed out namespace number one so the using directive basically it has directed our main function so the using directed can also be used to refer to a particular item within a namespace for example if you have let's say a variable let's say we have something like int x equal to 10 then since we are dealing with a let's just make it to b and then c out and then we are going to specify this x right here that is this variable x so when we just run this code you can see that first we have the namespace number two since now we are dealing with the namespace that is b so it printed out namespace number two and we have also printed out our variable as well so this is how basically you can use the using directive way in c you have to just write in if you talk about the syntax you have to write in the using keyword then you have to write in namespace which is again a building and then you have to write in the name space name for which you want to direct this main function so in this case it is directed for this b namespace so when the func is called it is going to call the function that is in this namespace so i guess that's it with this tutorial you now know how to use the using directive way and the normal way to access namespaces so thank you so much guys for watching and i'll see you guys in the next tutorial Hey guys, what's up? This is Omar Khan and I welcome you to another tutorial on namespaces in C++. In this tutorial, we are going to be covering nested namespaces. Now, what does the word nested basically mean? Nested means something inside something. So, nested namespaces means that a namespace that is declared inside a namespace. So, this is basically the syntax for what I am talking. We have this namespace n1 that has its first bracket right in here and the second bracket right in here and inside this body of the namespace n1 what we have that we have the declarations of namespace n1 but moreover we also have a namespace inside this namespace n1 that is named as n2 and in the namespace n2 body we can have the declarations for the namespace n2 so now how this is done practically with the help of an example and how we can actually then call the namespace 2 that is actually nested inside the namespace n1 so let's see how all this stuff is done so for example we have the first namespace as let's say s1 or let's just call it n1 and then we have another namespace that is n2 and in the first namespace for example we have a function that print out a simple c out statement for us that is the outside namespace function and what this second namespace is going to have is it's also going to have a function that has the type void and what this is going to do is that it's going to print out it is the inside function so we're going to write an inside namespace function and then now this namespace as I told you is going to be nested so we are going to just remove it from here and we are going to paste it right in here now as you can remember from the syntax that we have the namespace n1 and then we have the declarations for namespace s1 as you can see right here we have the namespace n1 then we have the declarations then we have the namespace n2 and then its declarations the very same which is written right here namespace n1 then the declarations that is the function for namespace n1 then we have the namespace n2 that is right this one over here this bracket as well this is the namespace n2 in which we have a function and this is the closing bracket for the nested namespace 
So this is now a nested namespace in which we have this namespace n1 which contains a namespace n2 and both have their functions. Now if you talk about the main function and let's say for example you want to call this function that is the nested function sorry the function that is the outside namespace function which is not in n2 but is a part of n1. So to use that using the using directive where what you're going to write and you're going to write in using namespace and as you know that you have to write in the name of the namespace and then this colon and then you have to simply write in the name of the function which you want to call. So if you just run this code now as you can see right here that it printed out outside namespace function because in this case we were using the using namespace n1 which was right here at the top that has the function func that printed out outside namespace function. Now if you just change it to n2 and run this code it is generating errors. Now why it is generating errors because it says that n2 is not a namespace name because since now n2 is inside the namespace of this n1 so what we are going to do is that we are going to tell our compiler that n2 is basically inside n1. Now how we are going to tell him we are going to write in n1 colon colon n2 which means that n2 is in n1. So now if you just run it it's going to print this statement. As you can see right here now it says inside namespace function since we have told him that n2 is inside n1 and we have to print out a function so it searched for n1 it searched for something n2 that is inside n1 and then it searched for this function that is inside n2 so it printed out inside namespace function so this is basically the concept of nested namespaces in c++ so i guess you have understood it well so thank you so much guys for watching and i'll see you guys in the next tutorial Hey guys, what's up? This is Sumer Khan and I welcome you to another tutorial on namespaces in C++. In this tutorial, we are going to be covering the topic that is, that is namespace aliasing and it is a very easy topic to understand. And basically this thing that is the aliasing of the namespace is introduced in this concept because we have to provide some ease to our user. For example, we have a nested namespace in which we have let's say five to six roots for example we have a namespace in which we have a namespace and in that namespace we again have a namespace and so on goes until let's say five to six leads then what we are going to do is that we are going to provide ease to our user for example if you want to access the last namespace that is nested in each and every namespace then to call any function from that namespace it's going to be a very fussy task so that is where namespace aliasing is going to help us out. So how it is going to be done, let's see this with us. So for example, we have a namespace that is S1. And inside that, this namespace, we have another namespace, let's say S2. In which we have another namespace, let's say S3 in which we have another namespace let's say s4 and i guess that's enough so for example we have a function in this namespace in which we have to simply see out a statement inside the fourth namespace so as you can see right here that this namespace s4 is nested in s3 which is nested in s2 which is nested in s1 so for the main function for example we are using the normal way to access the namespace then what you have to do basically is that you have to actually write in first the s1 then you have to write in s2 then you have to write in s3 then you have to write in s4 and then you have to write in func so if you just run this code you can see that it says inside the fourth namespace so for a single case i guess that's good but what for example we have a variable let's say int x equal to 10 in this then we have a variable int y equals to let's say 20 then we have another variable in z equal to let's say 30 
right here in this net state namespace S4. So to use each of these, what you have to do every time is that you have to write in S1, then S2, then S3, then S4, and then you have to write in X. For example, you want to access the value for X. And you have also to add a CF statement for this. So if you just run it, you can simply access the value of X and as well as this function right here at the top. As you can see right here, it says inside the fourth namespace and then it says 10. So now if you want to access this Y, you have to again write this complete set and for Z, you have to write in again this complete set. And for each and every entry you want to access from this namespace, you have to use this. So why not just give this statement right from here to here a name so then every time we are going to use that name to actually call this namespace. So what we are going to do is that we are going to use the namespace aliasing for this purpose. So right above here what we are going to write in we are going to write in namespace. Then we are going to write an alias name let's name it as alias. And then what we are going to do is that we are going to write this stuff that is S1, then S2, then S3, and then S4. Add a colon here. And now whenever you want to use this stuff, what you can simply do is that you can just use in this alias keyword. And this alias keyword here as well. Let's just run it. And you can see that the very same output has been generated as it was in the previous case. So now if you want to get access to the variable y or variable z, you can just copy this and paste it over here and you can just change it from here y to z. Now as you can see that the first task of writing this stuff has been removed and now you can simply write in alias over here. So I guess that was helpful and this is what is the purpose of namespace aliasing in C++ that is to provide ease to the user. So I guess that's it with this tutorial as well. Thank you so much guys for watching and I'll see you guys in the next tutorial. Hey guys what's up this is Umar Khan and I welcome you to another tutorial on namespaces in C++. In this tutorial we are going to see what is basically inline namespaces. An inline namespace is basically a namespace that uses the optional keyword inline in its original namespace definition. By using this inline keyword, what is the advantage basically is that you don't have to specify the object every time. You want to access an element of a nested namespace. For example, if we just move on to our compiler, and let's say we have a namespace, let's say S1. And inside that namespace, what we have is that we have an inline namespace that is S2. And in this, what we have is that we have, let's say, a simple variable int x equal to 10. And for example, we want to now access this int x equal to 10. So what we can do in this main function that we can just see out S1 and then this X. So if you just run this code, you can see that it will run perfectly. And you can see right here that 10 has been printed out. But if you remember from your previous concept that when you have to use the nested space, then you have to write in stuff like you have to write in then s1 and then you have to write in s2 and then this x and then it's going to be printed out but now in case of inline namespaces inline namespaces s2 is going to be treated as it is actually s1 and this variable in x equal to 10 is going to be treated like it is the part of this namespace s1 so as you can see that members of an inline namespaces are treated as if they are the members of the enclosing namespace in many situations. Now this property is transitive. If a namespace, for example, if you have a namespace N and it contains an inline namespace M, which in turn contain 
an inline namespace O, then the members of O can be used as though they, are, they were the members of M or N. For example, for we have S2, then we have, let's say, another namespace in this that is again an inline namespace that is S3. And let's say we have now here a variable int x equal to 10. So just this statement right over here is going to do our job. If we just print it out, you can see that 10 has been printed out because this 10 is considered to be a part of like it is a part of this S2 or this S1. You can also use it using this S2. But this is going to now generate error. Now why? Because S2 is basically inside and not outside. So the compiler does not know this that S2 actually exists. So what you have to do is that you have to write an S1 call an S2 and now it is going to run perfectly. And it is going to again print out that 10 for us. So this 10 is treated to be like it is a part of S2 and S1 is going to think that it is a part of my. So basically you have also understood one more concept in here that is how an inline space namespace can contain an other inline namespace. So the inline uh, specifier basically makes the declarations from the nested namespace and it appear exactly as if they had been declared in the enclosing namespace as you have seen in this example. This means that it drags out the declaration from nested namespace to the containing namespace. Now what are the advantages of using a namespace? There are basically two main advantages of using namespaces. The first one is it avoid the verbose. For example, if you consider this code and if these were not inline namespaces and you have to access this variable x, then what you have to do is that you have to add one more that is S3 and then you have to print it out. Now this looks good only if the namespace names are short as in this example we have covered but by using inline with the namespaces there is no need to type the entire namespace as given above or by using the directive method as well. So if you talk about the next part of this tutorial is that how inline namespaces are going to help you out in the using directive inside namespaces. It is going to help you in the very same behavior and it can also be achieved by using the using directive. A using directive that names the inline namespace is implicitly inserted in the enclosing namespaces. For example, if we consider this very same example in which we have namespace S1 and then inline namespace S2 and then inline space namespace S3 and then inline namespace S3 contain a variable in tax equal to 10, then if you are using the using directive way, then you have to write in using namespace and you only have to mention the name of S1. And then this stuff is going to be removed from here. And then if you just print out this X and just run this code, you can see that it ran and printed out 10 as well. So this was the very same concept in which this S1 thinks that X is a part of it, S2 thinks X is a part of it, and S3 also thinks X is a part of it. So this makes it actually a single bracket in which this X equal to 10 is contained. And you can also print it like this, because S2 also thinks that it is a part of it. So if you just run it, you can see that 10 is again printed, and S3 also think it is a part of it. So you can write an S3 here as well and run this. And again, it is going to print out 10 for us. You can see right here. So this was basically the purpose of using inline namespaces in C++. And you have also learned about the advantages of using namespaces, sorry, inline namespaces. And you have also seen how using the normal way and how by using the using directive inside namespaces, you can use the inline namespaces and it will help you out. So that's it with this tutorial. Thank you so much guys for watching and I'll see you guys in the next tutorial. Hey guys, what's up? This is Umar Khan and I welcome you to a new section here on this course on Advanced C++ in which we are going to be seeing the new features that are added in C++ 11. 
So the content covered in these tutorials are basically the additions that are made to C++11. These additions are lambda expressions, automatic type declaration and declaration type, uniform initializations, deleted and defaulted functions, null pointer, delegating constructors, R value references and new smart pointer classes. So we are going to be seeing all of these and we'll start on with the introduction tutorial in the next tutorial. So that's it with this tutorial. Thank you so much guys for watching and I will see you guys in the next tutorial. Hey guys, what's up? This is Umar Khan and I welcome you to another tutorial on C++ new features that were added in C++11. So this is basically an introduction tutorial in which we will see the introduction to C++11 and the features that were added to it. Now from 13 years since the first iteration of the C++ language, Danny Calif, that is a former member of the C++ standards committee, explains how the programming language has been approved and how it can help you write better code. Now Bajani Stropship that is the creator of C++ said recently that C++11 feels like a new language. The pieces just fit together better. Indeed, core C++ has changed significantly. It now supports lambda expressions, automatic type deduction of objects, uniform initialization syntax, delegating constructors, deleted and defaulted function declarations, null pointer, and most importantly, the R value references that is a new feature that argues a paradigm shift in how one conceives and handles object. And that's just a sample. We will cover all of these in this section. Now the C++ standard library was also revamped with the new algorithms, new container classes, automatic operations, type traits, regular expressions, new smart pointers, async facilities, and a course of multi-threading libraries. Now after the approval of C++ standard in 1998, two committee members prophesied that the next C++ standard would certainly include a built-in garbage collector that is also referred as GC and that it prob probably would not support multi-threading because of the technical complexities involved in defining a portable threading model. Now 13 years later the new C++ standard that is C++11 was completed and guess what? It lacks a garbage collector but it does include a state of the art threading library. So from the next tutorial we will start on with the features that will that were included in C++ 11 one by one and after seeing them you will understand yourself that how much useful these features are. So that's it with this tutorial. Thank you so much guys for watching and I'll see you guys in the next tutorial. Hey guys what's up this is Umar Khan and I welcome you to another tutorial that discuss about the new features that were added in C++ 11 and in this tutorial we are going to be discussing the very first feature that is lambda expressions. So a lambda expression basically let you define functions locally at the place of the call, hereby eliminating much of the tedium and security risks that function objects incur. Or maybe they want to search for all email addresses that also show up in another list. Now there are a lot of potentially interesting things to search for instead of building all of these options into the class. Wouldn't it be nice to provide a generate find method that takes a procedure for defining if an email address is interesting or not. Now to talk about the syntax of using lambda expressions, you can see it right on your screens. First we have to define the captures, then we have to define the parameters, then the return types declaration and in the body we will have our lambda statements. Now to elaborate further, if you talk about capture, the capture clause is also known as the lambda introducer and it specifies which outside variables are available for the lambda function and whether they should be captured by value or by reference. You will also be able to identify the start of a lambda expression with the presence of the capture clause and an empty capture clause means 
capture nothing in which case the lambda expression body does not access variable in the closing scope so we will get into much details of this when we cover our examples part so the next one is the parameters now this is the optional parameter list also known as the lambda declarator you can omit the parameter list if you want a function that takes zero arguments then we have the return types declaration as you can see on your screen now this is basically the return type most of the time the compilers can deduce the return type of the lambda expression when you have zero or one return statement however if it makes it easier to understand the code you can specify the return type now there are some differences among compilers regarding the automatic deduction of return types when you have more than one return type statement because the standard does not guarantee the automatic detection of return types now notice that the specification of the return types is basically based on the optional return value syntax that is introduced with C++11 which puts the return value after the function. And now to talk about the last thing that is lambda statements that is basically the body of the lambda function. The statements within the lambda body can access the captured variables and the parameters that are passed into that lambda function. So let's move on to the examples part now so let's move on to our compiler for that and we will start on with a very simple example in which we will make everything equal to let's say none because we are going to have no capture clause we are going to pass in no arguments the return type is going to be void and in the lambda statement part we are going to be printing a simple statement that it's going to be a c out statement so we already have this texture in the main function what we are going to do is that we are going to write in auto lambda since this is a lambda function and first we will define these brackets that are for the capture clause and these are going to be empty which means that this function basically wants in no capture clause then we are going to define empty brackets which means that it is also going to have no arguments and then we are going to specify the body as you can see that I have skipped the return type declaration and now I have skipped that when I skip that the compiler will deduce that the return type is basically wide if you I want to have some return type I would have specified it here but in this case the return type is going to be void and the compiler is going to deduce it by himself that the return type is wide since I have written nothing over here so in here we are going to have a simple c out statement which is going to say let's say it's going to say i am a lambda function and finally we have to put a colon in here and now what we are going to do is that we are going to call the function as lambda and then if we just run this code you can see the output right here on your screen that says I am a lambda function so this function has been called using the name with which it has been actually initialized so this is the way you have to call in lambda functions and lambda functions is going to be called in automatically now as previously explained some components of the lambda definitions are optional so if you write in three lines these are going to be completely equivalent so let me just write in those three lines so first we have let's say this very same line so we are going to just copy this from here paste it right here to just show you as you can see that the first one in which we have no capture clause no arguments no return type and we have then this body that have a simple c out statement now if you just write in here and just paste it the very same thing and right here in these parentheses if you write in white which means that it includes the parenthesis for the parameter list with the void keyword now this means that it is going to return in
and we are going to if we write in void over here this means that it is going to receive in no arguments and this statement above and this statement below have the very same meaning you can write it in both the ways whatever you like now the third one is that you can also specify the type as i told you that if you don't write anything over here this would the compiler is going to assume that the return type is going to be white but if you want to write in something here for your satisfaction then you can write in white like this an arrow and then this white statement and it is going to have the very same output so let me just show you how all this stuff is going to work this is basically the first way this is the second way and if i just remove it from here copy this from from here and then paste it right here and write in void over here and these are the three basically ways and these three lines show basically the very same examples of the definition of a lambda expression so let me just use them right above here so i will just remove it you now know the three ways so we can as i told you use void over here so if i just run it you're going to see that it's going to print out the very same output and if we talk about the third way we have to put in the return type that is going to be void and now if you just run this code you are going to yes you are going to witness the very same up output that says i am a lambda function so these are the three ways in which you can initialize this very same function that is going to print out the very same output void here means that there are no arguments which this function is going to receive and this void means that this function is going to return nothing so now let's move on to an example in which we are going to receive in some arguments so for example we are going to receive in two arguments let's say the first one is an integer value x and then we have an integer value y and let's just remove it for now all right now in this function what we are going to do is that we are going to let's say just print out the sum of those two numbers sum of numbers is and in here what we are going to do is that we are going to write in x plus y simple enough all right now the place from where we are calling this function we have to actually pass in some arguments to this function now so for example the arguments are 3 and 4 so now if we just run this function you are going to see right in that it says sum of numbers is 7 so this is how you can actually pass in arguments to a function now for example you want to call this function again with let's say some other arguments like say let's say this time you want to pass in 5 and 6 to this function so if you now run this code you can see that it says for sum of numbers is 7 that is for the first two inputs and then it says the sum of numbers is 11 that is for the second set of inputs and to now discuss on with the final case that is when this receives in some arguments and then it also has to return some value so in that case what we are going to do is that we are going to specify the return type as well so for example what this function is going to do is that it's going to let's say return an integer value then in that case what we are going to write in after this is we are going to write in this arrow and then we are going to write in int which means that the return type now is going to be an integer value and what is going to return is let's just cut this out and we are going to write in return the sum of those two numbers we are going to write in return x plus y so we'll just remove this second statement from here and we will operate it for these two values so it printed out nothing because we haven't stored it in some variable we have to store it first we have to write an int a equals to lambda then we have to see out the sum of two numbers is and then we are going to write in a that is 
the value that is stored. So now we are going to run it. And you can see right in that says the sum of two numbers is seven. So this is how basically you can just add a return type as well in this very same function. So this is how lambda functions can be used in your C++ programming. This was the syntax and the use as well. Uh, in the future tutorials, you are also going to have some more tutorial on lambda expressions and you will then come to know about certain built-in function in lambda expressions. For example, you are going to learn about a for each method and many others as well. So for now, let's move on to the conclusion part. So we have basically provided some very simple examples that allowed us to focus on the new syntax that was introduced by C++11 lambda expressions. You can apply all the things learned in these examples in a more complex scenario such as when you call an STL method or you work on with libraries that require functions that can be replaced with lambdas as happens with threading building blocks. So I suspect you will find that once when you start using C++11 lambdas. So when you start on using C++11 lambdas, there is no going back. So that's it, I guess, with this tutorial. And in the next tutorial, we will cover more features that were added in C++11. So thank you so much, guys, for watching. And I'll see you guys in the next tutorial. Hey guys, what's up? This is Umar Khan and I welcome you to another tutorial on this section in which we are discussing the new features that were added in C++11. In this tutorial, we are going to be discussing about uniform initializations. Now, uniform initializations is a feature in C++11 that allows the usage of a consistent syntax to initialize variables and objects ranging from primitive type to aggregates. In other words, it introduces brace initialization that uses braces to enclose initializer values. Now the syntax is, is shown right here on your screens. You can see first you have to specify the type, then you have to specify the variable name and then you have to specify the arguments. Now there are some of the different ways of initializing different types in uniform initializations. Uh, let me just show you how this is done. So we'll move on to our compiler and we don't want to output anything. What I need to do is I need to only show it to you that how we ha are going to do it. Now the first one is the uninitialized built-in type. That is a simple integer like this. This is basically the uninitialized built-in data type. Now the second one is the initialized built-in type that is basically something that has a value as well for example if you just make it equal to int i equal to 10 that it is no more an uninitialized it is an initialized built-in type. Then in the initialized built-in type we have one more type that is for example if you write in something like int k and we specify some value right in here this let's say it be two. So this is also an initialized built-in type. Then we have the aggregate initialization in which we have something like int a and specify the size right in here and then make it equal to some set of elements. Let's say this. So this is basically aggregate initialization. Then we have the default constructors and the parameterized constructors. To talk about the default constructors, it looks something like, for example, if we have the constructor A and then this is going to be V1 is going to be the object for this. So this is basically the default constructor. To talk about the parameterized constructors, what we are going to do is that we are also going to pass in, let's say, some arguments. Let's say one is going to be passed in to the function. So then we have the parameterized constructor with a single argument. You can, for example, if you have a single argument, which in this case, is, it is also a single argument. You can pass it in one more way. You can just write in the name of the object and you can make it equal to one. So this one is going to be passed in to the parameterized constructor as well. And then finally, we have the copy constructors in which what we are going to do is that we are going to copy from one object to another object. 
Now if this very same thing is initialized using brace initialization, then this very same initialization which we have done here can be rewritten in a different way. Now for example, the first one was the uninitialized type that looks something like this. Now if this is initialized using the brace initialization, then it would look something like this. And for the second one that is the initialized building type, this thing right here can be written in the very same way this is written right here. For example, if int i equal to 10, then for brace initialization, this can be done it like this. So the next one is the aggregate initialization, which will look the very same way when you are dealing with the brace initialization. Similarly, if you talk about the constructor and destructor, then it is going to look a bit different. For example, the default constructor is going to look something like, for example, this is going to be class A, for example, then X1 is the object. Then for brace initialization, you have to add these brackets for the default constructor. For the parameterized constructor, it is going to look the very same way. And for the copy constructor that is right here, in brace initialization, this thing right over here that is actually the copy constructor, it is going to look something like A and you have to write in V1. Then the object to which it is going to be copied is going to be written right in the brackets. So this is how this can be done using brace initializations. So now if we move ahead, the next thing is the application of uniform initializations. Now there are four applications of uniform initialization. The first one is the initialization of dynamically allocated arrays. The second one is the initialization of an array data member of a class. The third one is the initialization of an array data member of a class. And the fourth one is the implicitly initialize function parameter. So let's start on with the first one that is the initialization of dynamically allocated arrays. So let's just see an example of how it will be done. So we will just move on here. We will remove this stuff from here. And now what we are going to do is that we are going to write a simple C++ program that is going to demonstrate the initialization of dynamic array in C++ using uniform initialization. So this library, as you know from the start, that this is going to be included right in here. So the next thing we are going to do is that we are going to code this main function. And what are we going to do in this main function is that first we are going to declare a dynamic array. Then we are going to print the contents of that array. And the dynamic array which we are going to declare is going to be initialized using braces. So for example, it is an integer array, which means that it store integer elements. So it is going to be an integer pointer since it is going to point towards the element basically. And it is going to be created using new int, which means an array class is going to be called in. Five are going to be the number of elements in that array. And let's say the elements are one, two, three, four, and five. Now, if you want to print the contents of that array, what we are going to do is that we are going to use a for loop int i equal to zero. Since we are going to start on from the very first element, then it is going to iterate until i less than five. And then finally i plus plus. So in this loop, what we are going to do is that we are going to write in c out. And we are going to write in pi plus i. So for the first time it is going to print out the first element then it is going to keep iterating until the last element. So let's just run this code. And equal to sign over here. And here is the output that says one, two, three, four, five. That is the output of this program that has printed out the elements of the dynamically allocated array that was 
initialized using the brace initialization. So this was a very simple example of the first case that is the initialization of dynamically allocated arrays. So the second one is the initialization of an array data member of a class. So let's also just go at an example for how this is going to work. So I will just remove this and we are going to write in a C++ program to initialize an array data member of a class with uniform initialization. So in this case, we are going to create a class right after this. And in this class, what we are going to do is that we are going to create an array of, let's say the size of the array is four. And after this, we are going to initialize an array using uniform initialization. And that array is going to be public in this case. So what we are going to do in here is that we are going to create a, and then we are going to receive the elements in this constructor function that are int x, int y, int z, and let's say next element is int w. So right in here, what we are going to do is that we are going to insert these elements in the array. So these are actually the elements of that are going to be received in this constructor function. And now what we are going to do is that we are going to actually simply insert these elements into the array. So since this is a single line, let's just do it like this and then you're going to write in the name of the array and then you are going to write in x y z and w and finally these brackets and these are basically the brackets of this constructor function so now after this what we are going to do is that we are going to create a function that is the print function and in this print function what we are going to do is that we are going to simply print out the elements of this array so we are going to use a for loop for this and we are going to write in for int i equal to 0 i is less than 4 i plus plus and in this for loop what we are going to do is that we are going to simply see out the array elements as we did in the previous case so it is going to be array plus one not plus one it is going to be i and finally this and now right down here in the main function what we are going to do is that we are going to create new object and the number to initialize the array with will be passed into as arguments to the constructor so we are going to write in a a we are then going to pass the elements let's say the element are one two three and four then using this object we have created we are going to call in the print function and finally return zero now one more thing we need to do in here is that you have also yes we already have this so let's just run this code So you can see that it printed out the elements of the array. So this was how you can basically initialize an array data member of a class and print the elements of the array. Now the third case is the implicit initialization objects that is to return. So let's also see an example of how this is done. So we'll just remove this stuff from here. We will remove this stuff from here as well and we are also going to create a class in this case and in this class what we are going to do is that we are going to create in two elements that is int x and int y and we are going to basically implicitly initialize two objects and we are going to return these values whatever will be these values and these values will be basically what is going to be passed in when the object is implicitly created so we are going to create the constructor function that is going to be public 
and in this what we are going to do is that we are going to receive in two values let's say int a and int b and what we are going to do with this value is that we are going to write in a not a we are going to write in x a and a comma then we are going to write in y b and then finally this is the body of the constructor function so basically this is called the implicit initialization of an object to return some values so this is what is going to return the values for us basically this int x and this int y is going to store these values and then these values are going to be returned now how this is going to be returned for that we have to create a print function that is going to print out the elements and in this print function what we are going to do is that we are going to see out the value of a and then we are going to see out the value of b and now what we are going to do is that we are going to actually return these values now how these values are going to be returned this print function is also going to be public in this case now right after this what we are going to do is that we are going to create an overloaded constructor and the compiler is going to automatically deduce that the constructor of the class a needs to be called and the function parameter of the function are basically going to be passed here so how this is going to be done we are going to write in the name of the class then you have to write in anything like f and then you have to write in the values that are int a and int b they are going to be x and y in this case and x and y here as well because these are actually the values that are now stored in as public right above here since these values are only visible the into a and this int b are only visible to this constructor function since these are the arguments passed into this so we are going to use this x and y in which the values are actually passed in now in this function what we are going to do is that we are going to write in return a not a x and y now the compiler is automatically going to deduce that the constructor of class a needs to be called and the function parameter of this f right here are needed to be passed here now if you talk about the main function right in here what we are going to do is that we are going to first create an object and we are going to write in f then we are going to pass in some values let's say one and two and then using this object you are going to call in the print function and finally return zero yes one mistake we did here is that we have to make this function out of this class because if And yes one thing we have to do in here is that we have to declare this stuff out of this class because if you don't do so this statement that is axf12 is going to generate error now why it is going to basically generate error is because this thing is outside the scope of this call for example if i just press ctrl z and this statement is right in here and you run this code you're going to see an error generated that says f was not declared in the scope but if you just remove this and paste it right in here this statement over here is going to access this now how is the compiler going to know that this constructor is going to be called as i told you earlier that the compiler is going to automatically deduce that the constructor of class a needs to be called and the function parameter of f are needed to be passed in here so these values are going to be then returned 
here and what this x dot print is going to do is that it's going to call in this function and it is going to print in basically this a over here is going to tell it that it is the part of the class a so it is going to receive the values of this x and y and these are going to be returned from here and printed using this statement so if you now just run this code it is not going to generate any error i guess and yes it didn't and it has also printed out the values for us so this was the third case that was if implicitly initialize the object to return values now the final and the fourth case is implicitly initialize the function parameter so let's see an example of this as well so we will remove this stuff from here and we will also remove this stuff from here now what we are going to do is that we are going to create a c++ program to demonstrate how to initialize a function parameter using uniform initialization so the same we are going to have a class a and then we are going to have two variables let's say int a and int b and then in the public constructor what we are going to do is that we are also going to receive in two values int x and int y b and with these values what we are going to do is that we are going to actually store them and where we are going to store them in these variables so we are going to write in a x and a y and then this is the body of the constructor function and now right in here what we are going to do is that we are going to create print function as we did in the previous example and we are going to simply see out a C out B. Now you don't need to get confused that in the previous example I have written X and Y here and now I'm writing A and B here. That's because I have actually initialized A and B in here. In the previous case I have initialized X and Y here and int A and int B in here. But now I've just reversed it. So that was not on purpose. That was just declared. So we have to use an A and B in here and A and B right here as well and this needs to be void print now what we have to do is that the very same way we have to create now in the previous case as you know that we have actually used the constructor now what we are going to do is that we are going to now create a function actually and we are going to first write in the name of the function and then we are going to write in this x that is the object and in this function what we are going to do is that we are going to call in the shoe print function and in here in the main function what we are going to do is that we are going to call the function and initialize its argument using the brace initialization so we are going to write in f and then write in here we are going to use the brace initialization and we are going to pass in the value let's say the value r1 and 2 and we are going to write in return zero so if you just run this code it is going to solve our case number four right it says expected unqualifier id and then it says multiple initializations given for this a so yes this needs to be removed from here and this has to be by so now let's just run it again and right here it has generated the output we required that are the elements that is one and two so it has the very same logic that the compiler is automatically going to deduce that the function of class a needs to be called and the function parameter of the void function that was declared outside that class are going to be passed in to this print function that is going to print out the values for us so first the values are going to be received in this these are going to be copied in the global variables right here that are initialized and then these are going to be printed using this function so that's it with case number four so i guess that's clear so that's it with this tutorial as well so this is how basically uniform initialization is used in c11 so i will see you guys in the next tutorial 
where we will cover more on the features added in C++ 11. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you guys in the next tutorial. Hey guys, what's up? This is Sumer Khan and I welcome you to another tutorial on this section in which we are discussing about the new features that were added in C++ 11. So in this tutorial, we are going to be learning about the deleted and defaulted functions. So let's start on with the default. Now explicitly defaulted function declaration is a new form of function declaration that is introduced into the C++11 standard. You can append the equal to default that is a built in word. This specifier to the end of a function declaration to declare that function as an explicitly defaulted function. Now the compiler is going to generate the default implementation for explicitly defaulted functions which are more efficient than manually programmed function implementations. Now a function that is explicitly defaulted must be a special member function and has no default arguments. Explicitly defaulted function can save your effort of defining those functions manually. So if you have a class that is defined with any constructor, the compiler will not generate a default constructor. Now this is useful in many cases, but it is sometime waxing. For example, if I just show you an example and I move on to my compiler and I have for example a class A and in this class A I have a public constructor that looks something like A and that also receives an arguments let's say A and this is the body. So So in the main function, if I just write in a, a, then the compiler will complain that we have no default constructor. For example, if I just run this code, you can see that it is generating an error that says no matching function for call a to a. It says the candidates are a int a. Candidates expects one argument zero provided and many other type of errors. Now, this er these errors are basically generated because the compiler did not make the one for us because we already have had one that we defined. Now we can force our compiler to make the one for us by using the default specifier. For example, if we have this very constructor right in here and let's say we define one more constructor that receives in no argument and we define it as default. So now if we do the very same stuff that is AA and we run this code, you can see that it ran perfectly because the compiler did not complain about this anymore because we, when this was called in, it access this that was the default constructor. So you can basically declare both inline and out of line explicitly defaulted functions. You can declare a function as an explicitly defaulted function only if the function is a special member function and has no default arguments. The explicitly defaulted function declaration enable more opportunities in optimization because the compiler might treat explicitly defaulted function as trivial. So this is how default works in C++11. Now there was one more feature that was added. We are also going to discuss that. That was the deleted. Now the C++11 standard basically introduced deleted function declaration as a new form of function declaration. Now to declare a deleted function, you can append the equal to delete as in the previous case, you have to append the equal to delete sorry, the equal to default specifier. So in this case, you have to append the equal to delete specifier to the end of a function declaration. The compiler prohibits the usage of a deleted function. For example, you can declare the implicitly defined copy constructor and copy assignment operator of class, any class, let's say class A as deleted functions to prevent object copy of that class. So for example, we have a class that is going to have a constructor that is going to take an integer. 
So it is going to be a class A and it is going to have a public constructor int A and we don't have this stuff right in here. Then if we just move on to the main function, then we are going to write in first A, A10, which means that we have actually called in this constructor that is having some argument. So this statement is going to work perfectly. This is going to be a correct statement. Now, the second statement is, let's say we initialize one more object and pass in, uh, let's say a float value to it. Let's say the value of pi 3.14. So this is also going to be okay because the 3.14 is going to be converted to an integer of three and the, this part 14, that is the decimal part is going to be truncated itself. Now, if you write in a equals to b, so this is also going to be okay because we have a compiler generated assignment operator. However, what if that was not we wanted? We do not want the constructor allow double type parameter nor the assignment to work. C++11 allow us to disable certain feature by using delete. So what we are going to do is that we are going to actually disable the conversion. So we are going to right in here we are going to have the very same constructor then what we are going to do is that we are going to create a that is going to have double and we are going to write in delete now what does this mean this means that the conversion has now been disabled and we are going to write in a it is going to equal to And this is basically that the assignment operator has been now disabled. Now, if we write the code, that is the very same here in the main function, a, a, e, a, a, and this is going to be completely fine. But now if you write an a, b, that is 3.14, this is going to generate an error because conversion from double to integer has been disabled. Right in here, as you can see that we have disabled the conversion to double using this constructor and using this delete specifier and secondly we also have this line that is a equal to b that is the assignment operator line so this as this has also been disabled right here so this line is also going to generate an error so basically the purpose of the delete specifier is to actually disable certain features in c++ which you want to disable. For example, in the previous case, when you passed in this 3.14 to this very same constructor that is expecting an integer value. So what is going to do with that double value that is going to convert that double value into an integer value by truncating the decimal part. For example, you don't want any decimal value to be passed into this constructor function. So what you are going to do is because this is the default behavior of C++ compiler to actually convert this. So what you want in your code was that for example you don't want any conversion from double to integer you only want this function this constructor to receive an integer value so what you are going to do is that you are going to use the delete specifier and you are going to disable certain feature and in this case we have disabled two features first we have actually stopped the conversion and secondly we have disabled the assignment operator so these two lines are going to generate an error message for us and I guess this has to be a built-in world that is operator over here that is going to actually stop the assignment operator this has to be a built-in work so I have to write in the complete operator as you can see that it also has been bolded by the compiler itself so now these two lines you are going to see that they are going to generate an error so you can see that it says line number 19 that is the use of deleted function a to double is not allowed secondly in line number 20 as you can see right in here use of defaulted function a a and operator which means that the assignment operator has also been disabled so in this way we could achieve what we intended so once you have used a deleted keyword with a function then the compiler will prohib prohibit the usage of a deleted function for example you can declare the implicitly defined copy constructor and copy assignment operator of class a as deleted functions to prevent copy object of that class for example you can declare the implicitly defined copy constructor and copy assignment operator of class a 
as deleted functions to prevent the object copy of that class. So let me give you one more example of what I'm talking. So we will have this very same class in which we have a public constructor and this public constructor is going to be empty. It is going to be something like this and then we will actually disable the copy constructor and we will disable the copy assignment operator. Now you know that copy assignment operator is deleted in this way that use a and operator equal to constant a and and then we are going to delete this. Now to disable the copy constructor what you are going to write in you are going to write in a the very same way this one is written right in here and then you are going to write in it is going to equal to delete. So simply the name of the class the constant and then a address so this is going to be deleted which means that this assignment for the class the address pointing it that address is going to be deleted so if we have in the main function we will just remove the stuff from here and for example we have the object one that is a1 and then if we use the copy constructor for example if i just write in a a2 that is an object 2 and we make I make it equal to a1 so this is going to generate error because the copy constructor has been disabled already so if I just run this code you're going to see that it is going to generate error that says use of de deleted function which means that a function that was deleted has been used which is not allowed and it was deleted right up here so the second thing was the copy assignment operator and it is going to be the very same as it was in the previous case for example we have an object 3 and I just write in a3 equal to a1 so it is also going to generate error as the previous one had generated an error so I will just comment it out so that you can see this error so you can see right here that it says use of deleted function and it is the very same so in this example although only one copy constructor and one copy assignment operator are declared as deleted function explicitly the compiler can detect the declaration of the user defined copy and copy assignment operator so the compiler will no longer explicitly define any other copy constructor or copy assignment operator that have different parameters so in this case the copy and assignment operations between the class objects are totally prohibited. So this is how delete function actually the delete specifier actually work. You can disable the feature you want to disable. So this is it with this tutorial. You now know the two keywords that were introduced into C++11 the default and the deleted specifier. So that's it with this tutorial. Thank you so much guys for watching and I'll see you guys in the next tutorial. Hey guys, what's up? This is Umar Khan and I welcome you to another tutorial on this section in which we are discussing the new features that were added in C++11. So in this tutorial, we are going to be basically discussing about null pointer. So C++11 basically introduced a new keyword null PTR as a null pointer constant the null pointer constant can be distinguished from integer 0 for overloaded functions. The constants of 0 and null are treated as of the integer type for overloaded functions whereas null pointer can be implicitly converted to only the pointer type, pointer to pointer member type and boolean type. So before C++ if you talk initializing null pointers with 0 or null makes it impossible to distinguish between a null pointer and integer 0 for overloaded function. For example, if you see the following two functions as mentioned on the slides, you can see that the first one is receiving an integer value and then the second one is receiving a pointer actually. So when you call the overloaded function with this statement, that is the func and then you pass in null to it. So can you guess which function is going to be called? Now you might be thinking that this second function over here that is void func character steric s this should be called because the actual parameter null looks like a pointer. 
However, surprisingly, the call funk null resolve to funk int, the top one here, this call is going to call this. Now, why is this going to call the above function? Because null is a macro and equals to the integer zero, which is of the integral type instead of the pointer type. Now, to solve such problems of null pointer constant, C++11 introduced a new keyword that was null ptr. The null ptr constant can be distinguished from integer zero for overloaded function. For example, if you see the very same example right on your screen and call the previous overloaded function with this statement now that is the func null ptr, then can you guess what function is going to be called? Yes, now you are correct because this very same function is going to be called. Now a null pointer constant with the null pointer value has some characteristics. The first characteristics it has that it can be converted to any pointer or pointer to member type. Secondly, it cannot be implicitly converted to any other type except for the Boolean type. Third, it cannot be used in an arithmetic expression. Fourth, it can be compared with the integer zero and fifth, it can be used in relational expressions to compare with pointers or data of the standard null PTR type. Now it should be noted that in C++11, it is still acceptable to assign the value zero or null to a pointer. Now what are basically the difference between null and null PTR? So basically null is a manifest constant as defined by C. That is actually an integer that can be assigned to a pointer because of an implicit conversion. Whereas if you talk about null PTR, it is a keyword that is representing a value of self-defined type that can be converted into a pointer, but not into integers. So, as you can see right on your screen, you can see some example. The first one is int i equal to null. Then you can see the very same i equal to null ptr. And then you can see a pointer that equal to null. And then you can see a pointer p that equal to null ptr. Now, can you guess which statement is actually correct and which statement is wrong? Now, the first statement over here is completely correct because you can initialize an integer to null. But if you talk about the second one, it is going to generate an error because it is not an integer convertible value. If you talk about the third one, it is completely okay because integer is converted into a pointer. Whereas if you talk about the fourth one, it is also going to be perfectly all right. And why it is going to be perfectly all right? Because of the very same reason we discussed in the previous slide. So that is important to solve an ambiguity that can arise in generic programming. Now suppose you have again two overloaded functions as you can see on your screen the first one is void func and is receiving and is expecting to actually receive an integer value and the second one is void func that is expecting to receive a pointer value. So now if you make the very same call as you did in the previous case you call in func null then you are actually calling two things. First, you are calling the variant being null an integer, but func null pointer that is right in here, it will call the second variant being null pointer, not an integer. Now to avoid the risk to call one function instead of another, always use a zero if you want an integer and null pointer if you want a pointer. So I guess that's clear. So this was basically the purpose of null PTR. The to conclude my statements, null PTR was only added to remove the ambiguity about zero and null since those two were treated as the very same by the compiler. So to remove that confusion, C++11 basically introduced this keyword that was the null PTR. So I guess that's clear. So that's it with this tutorial as well. Thank you so much guys for watching and I'll see you guys in the next tutorial. Hey guys, what's up? This is Sumer Khan and I welcome you to another tutorial on this section in which we are discussing the new features that were added in C++11. 
So in this tutorial, we are going to be discussing about the feature that is delegating constructors that was added in C++11. Before C++11, common initialization in multiple constructor of the same class could not be concentrated in one place in a robust maintainable manner. So partially elevated as problem in the existing C++ program, you could use the assignment instead of initialization or add a common initialization function. Now with the delegating constructor feature, you can concentrate common initialization and post initializations in one constructor named as target constructor. Now delegating constructor can call the target constructor to do the initialization. A delegating constructor can also be used as the target constructor of one or more delegating constructor. So you can use this feature to make program more re readable and maintainable. Now delegating constructors and target constructors present the same interface as other constructors. Target constructors do not need special handling to become the target of a delegating constructor. They are selected by the overload resolution or template argument detection. Now after the target constructor completes its execution, the delegating constructor gets its control back. A delegating constructor can be a target constructor of another delegating constructor thus forming a delegating chain. The first constructor invoked in the construction of an object is called the principal constructor. A constructor cannot delegate to itself directly or indirectly. The compiler can detect this violation if the constructor invoked in a recursive chain of delegation are all defined in one translation unit. Now you can use the delegating constructors feature interacting with other existing techniques that includes first when several constructors have the same name, name and overload resolution can then determine which constructor is the target constructor. Secondly, when using delegating constructor in a template class, the deduction of template parameter works normally. Now if you talk about C++ 3, there are often cases where it would be more useful for one constructor to call another constructor in the same class. Unfortunately, this is disallowed by C++ 03. Commonly, this end up resulting in either duplicate code or use of an initializer non-constructor function to keep the common code accessible to both constructors that need it. Now how does it actually look like with C++03 and how it was then corrected by C++11? I will give you an example of that and then you will be much more clear of what I'm talking. So here we are. So in here, for example, we have a class A. And in this class A, what we are going to have is that we are going to have a public constructor. And this is our constructor body. So for example, if we have one more constructor here that receives some value A, and for example, we have to write some code in here that is named as code 1 and then in here we have to write in some code 2 but we also want to use code A. So what we are going to do is that we are going to write in code 1 right in here again. So as you can see right in here that the code 1 is defined twice and as I talked about that use of initializer or non-constructor function when you have to write in the common code or you have to write in the initializer or non-constructor function to keep the common code accessible to both constructor. So in that case, this very same code is going to look something like, we are going to have this very same A function and in here, we are going to have INIT, that is the initializer for let's say, Let's call it as x and then right in here 
in the second function we are going to have this very same initializer that is i and i t x and as you can see right in here that the code to write in a is here the code to write in this is right in here and now for example we have a white i n i t x right in here and in here for example we have to write in code number one so while using the i n i t method it is considered a better practice than duplicating code now it has a couple of downsides as well first it's not quite as readable as it adds a new function and several new function calls second because i n i t x is not a constructor it can be called during the normal program flow where member variables may already be set and dynamically allocated memory may already be allocated this means that i n i t x needs to be additionally complex in order to handle both the new initialization and reinitialized cases properly now c plus plus 11 actually solves these problems and it adds the ability to chain constructor together that is also called as delegating constructor for which i've been talking at the very start now how this is going to actually help you that we are going to have this very same thing in which we are going to have a class a then we are going to have a constructor and in here for example we have to write in code number one and then we have the second constructor that has some argument then what we are going to do is that for example in here we want code number one and code number two as well so now what delegating constructor is going to help us that we don't have to write in this code now how this constructor that is receiving an, an argument is going to get this code is by the property of c11 to actually chain the constructor now how this constructor is going to be chained to this constructor is a very easy task you only have to add this constructor after this so this constructor that is receiving no argument is going to actually be chained to this constructor that is receiving an argument and code number one is automatically going to be accessed by this constructor so as you can see that it is much cleaner so one thing to note you should always use the initialization list syntax when delegating constructor as compilers that do not support delegating constructor will generally flag this as a compiler error so if you try to call one constructor from the body of another constructor the compiler will not complain and your program may also not behave as expected so this is how basically constructors are chained and your code looks much cleaner much easier the duplication of code is also removed as you can see that this code one and code two is used by this as a whole and this constructor only can use code number one so i guess that's it with this tutorial thank you so much guys for watching and i'll see you guys in the next tutorial hey guys what's up this is umar khan and i welcome you to another tutorial on this section in which we are discussing the new features that were added in c 11 in this tutorial we are going to be discussing about the r value references but before discussing r value references you need to know about what is passed by value so when a function gets its parameter as by value it does copy the compiler knows how to copy it if it's a user defined type we may need to provide the copy constructor and probably the assignment operator as well to be able to do a deep copy however copying process is expensive actually there are a bunch of copying going on when we use the stl containers when an object tossed in by value since it's a temporary object we are really wasting our precious resources including the cpu as well as the memory and so on so we need to find a way to avoid such an unnecessary copy now the question arises why our values were introduced 
So the primary purpose of introducing an R value is to actually implement move semantics. So what is move semantics? So before moving ahead, you need to know about this term. In C++ 3, there was a costly and unnecessary deep copies that can happen implicitly when objects are passed by values. We can avoid the performance hit due to the deep copy by using an R value references. Now we have a way to determine if a reference variable refers to a temporary object or to a per permanent object. So how it can be used? The main usage of R value reference is to create a move constructor and a move assignment operator. If you talk about the move constructor, it acts like a copy constructor. It takes an instance of an object as its argument and it creates a new instance from the original object. However, the move constructor can avoid memory reallocation because we know it has been provided a temporary object. So rather than copy of the fields of the object, we will move them. In other words, the R value references and move semantics allow us to avoid unnecessary copies when working with temporary objects. We do not want to move the temporary which will go away. So the resources needed for the temporary objects can be used for other objects as well. The R values are typically temporary and they can be modified. If we know that our function parameter is an R value, we can use it as a temporary storage or take its contents without affecting the output of our program. This means that we can just move the contents rather than the, to copy the contents of an R value parameter. This saves a lot of memory allocation and it provides a lot of scope for optimization for large dynamic structures. So now let's move on to R value references. So as I told you that the primary purpose of introducing an R value is to basically implement move semantics. R value references actually enable us to distinguish between an L value that is actually the locating value or you may say the locator value from an R value. The C++11 standard introduces R value references which bind only to R values. They are declared with two amster stands rather than one ampersand. So let me just give you some example of how R values look like and how they can be used in C++11. So this is our compiler and in here if you talk about R value references, it actually looks something like you have to write in the type and then you have to add in two addresses. Then you have to write in the name of the variable, let it be REF and then you can write in a value that is 99. So you have to note here that only an L value can be assigned to our normal reference. So if we, for example, write in int and ref equal to 99 then this part is going to generate error that is the invalid initialization of a non-constant reference to the type this that is int address from an r value of type integer so if you run this code you can see that it is going to generate an error that says conflicting declaration previous declaration as int and an ref or if you just change its name to something like refe, it is again going to generate an error because it says that invalid initialization of a non-constant reference of type this from an R value of type int as I told you before. So if you're dealing with this part, so if you just remove this from here and you want to do it using a single operator, then you, what you have to do is that you have to first initialize the value. For example, I just write in int x equal to two and then I'm going to actually use this reference and then I'm going to write in the name of the variable actually. I cannot make a direct reference. So if I now just run this code, it is going to run perfectly. So in the previous case, you have seen that if I just write in some variable here and directly make a reference to it like this, it is going to generate error saying that it is an invalid, invalid initialization of a non-constant reference to the type int and from an R value of type int. So this is an example of R value reference. Now we have, let's say two function. 
one that's taking an L value reference and the other that is taking an R value reference. So how this can be done? Let's just remove this stuff from here. And right above here, let's say we have two functions. First one is white F that is going to receive a normal one that as I told you that is going to take an L value, which means that it is going to be something like this. Then in the body of this, what we are going to do is that we are going to see out since this is an L value, so we are going to write an L value reference and we are going to print out the variable and an inline space. So we are going to now create one more function that is going to have the very same name, but it is going to use an R value reference. And with this, what we are going to do in this body is that we are going to see out since this is an R value reference. So we are going to write an R value reference and we are going to print out the value. So good enough. Now in the main function, what we are going to do is that we are going to do the calling part. So first we need to give this I a value. Let's say the value of I is 10. So now if I just call this function by passing this, then what is going to be called? It is going to call the L value reference. But if I just pass in some value right in here, then what it's going to do is that it's going to call in this R value reference. And why this is going to actually call this, as I told you before, when I was doing this is an example that if you write in this, and let's say you make it equal to X and you make it to point towards something, then it is going to work perfectly. But if you make something like this, it is not going to work perfectly. But if you make it like some value here and then you point it towards this X, then it's going to work perfectly. You have to just change this to some other value. So now it's going to work perfect. So as you can see in this example that if you pass in the value, so you know that in case of R value, you cannot directly reference a value. So in this case, since this is not directly referencing a value in this case, since first we have initialized a value and then we are pointing towards the integer in which this value is actually stored in that is the variable I. So this is going to call the L value. And in this case, since we are making a direct reference towards this 99 so what it's going to do is it's going to call the second function that says r value reference yep we missed this one and right here as you can see that it says l value reference 10 and r value reference 99 so i guess this is clear so if you talk about move semantics here so if you just scroll down here into the main function and what we are going to do is that we are going to call in the f function but what we are going to now do is that we are going to use the move function and then we are going to write in i which means the value has been now passed now what is going to be called actually this function that is the r value reference function is going to be called now why it is going to be called because that the move i is calling a function taking an r value this is possible because the move takes an l value and it converts it into an R value. So an expression is basically an R value if it results in a temporary object. So if you just run this code, you are going to see the output that says R value reference 10. So you can see that for the first one, the L value reference was 10, but now when you use the move function and pass in the L value, it result in calling the R value reference. So as I told you that R value is basically an expression that results in a temporary object. For example, if I have a function right above here, and for example, I have a function that's return type is int, and let's say the name of the function is A, and what we have in this function is an, a variable, let's say x is the variable and it is equal to, let's say a value two. 
and then what I do is that I simply return this x. Now in the main function, if you just remove this stuff from here, and what you do is that you see out only this a function, whatever is returned by this function, since this is a returning function and it is going to return an integer value. So if you just run this code, all right, now it's going to run. Yep, as you can see that it has printed that value. So basically this function a is an R value because if you note that the value being returned is not a reference to the variable X, but it's just a temporary value. Now in C++ 0x, we could use a normal or L value reference to bind temporary object, but only if it was constant. For example, if I just move down here, and as I'm talking that we could use a normal or L value reference to bind temporary object, but only if it was a constant. So I mean by this that whatever this reference is going to be, it is going to be a constant value as you can see right here. For example, we can now call in the function a and it is going to be perfectly all right. So I'll just remove it from here, paste it right here. And if I just run this code, it is going to run perfectly. So no error generated. But now if I do the very same and just remove this in this statement from here and do not make it constant and run this code, it is going to generate error saying that it is an invalid in initialization of non-constant reference of type integer reference from an R value of type n. Now in C++11, the R value reference let you bind a mutable reference to an R value but not an L value. In other words, R value references are perfect for detecting whether a value is a temporary object or not. For example, if you just remove this statement from here and then you write in constant int an R value and then you call this very same function a, then this is perfectly right as it was in the previous case when you use a single and operator but now in the previous case, if you wrote in something like this with a single and operator and call the function a, it generated an error. But now in case of r value, since you are using the r value now, it is not going to generate any kind of error. All right, this has to be a different variable name. Let's make it equal to value. And this is going to be now perfectly all right. So as you can see that the code ran perfectly, no error was generated in here. So if you just compare those references, so how to compare those references, we are going to make in two functions for that. So the first function is going to be for an L value and a constant value that is going to be receiving a constant value. And the second one is going to be for an R value. So for example, let's say the name of the first function is uh, A and it is receiving a constant L value. All right, so the next function right here is going to be a void and this is also going to be a void function since it's not going to return anything now. What it's going to do is that it's going to simply see out whatever value is received in. All right, so right down here in the second function, let's say the name of the function is B, then in this function, what we are going to do is that we are going to simply see out the whatever value is received in this function and how this value is going to be received. This is going to be an R value receiving. So it is going to be written with double end operator and then this value. So basically the function A takes a constant L value reference and it will accept any argument, whether it be an L value or an R value. However, the second overloaded B steric take only an R value reference. In other words, by using the R value references, we can use function overloading to determine whether the function parameters are L values or R values by having one overloaded function taking an L value reference and another taking an R value reference. In other words, C++11 introduces a new non-constant type 
a reference called an R value reference identified by the name of the variable and then a double AND operator. And yes, one thing over here, this has to be the very same name as it is for this because we are discussing actually the overloading here because when an L value is going to be passed in, this function is going to be called in and when the R value is passed into a function, this function is going to be called in. So you don't have to change the name of these functions. The name of this function is going to be the very same. What's going to determine or going to tell the main function which functions to be called is, it's going to determine by these arguments and how it is going to determine by these arguments because this receive only an L value and this receive only an R value. So now basically this refers to temporaries that are permitted to be modified after they are initialized which is the cornerstone of move semantics. So let me give you a, an example of this. So we have very same stuff over here. What we're going to do is let's add some professionalism to this. And since this is the left value, so we are going to write in this. And for this one, what we are going to write in, we are going to write in simply our value and this. So now what we are going to add in this is that we are going to add a function that is going to be of integer type and it is going to be the very same function uh, which was initialized in the previous example that was the a function but since now we have already used the a function so we are going to use it as b function and in this what we are going to print out we are going to actually print out we are going to first initialize something and then we are going to return it since it is a function that is going to return an integer value so what we are going to do is that we are going to initialize a temporary value and since as you can see right here that we are actually dealing with a value over here so first what we are going to do is that we are going to create a temporary value and make it equal to any number 10 let's say and then we are going to simply return that temporary value so now in the main function what we are going to do is that first we are going to initialize a value let's say i is the value and make it equal to 11 then what we are going to do is that we are going to call in the a function by passing in this i and then we are going to call in the a function but now what we are going to do is that we are actually going to pass in this function that is the function b and this is actually uh, the a function and it is actually going to pass in the value 10 so if you just run this code you are going to see yourself what is going on so you can see, as you can see that first it says l value for this one it says the l value 11 which means that it is printed out this because this was passed in to the function that was the l value function so it printed out simply this 11 now when you pass in this function what it actually did is that it went to this function it grabbed its value that was stored in this variable since this function was returning this temp value so it grabbed that value put it in these brackets and now this a function was called in by passing in this value so when this value only this value was passed in what it did that it called the r value function and this stuff over here was printed as you can see right on your screens so i hope it's clear so as you can note here that we took out the constant from the void a function that was the l value function actually so that it can take only the l value now we have two distinct functions that can be overloaded one taking an l value and the other one taking an r value so what it basically gives us a way to write more efficient program with less coding so i hope you have understood all these examples so if I just give you a brief summary for what we have been com covering so far so basically our value references are added 
into C++11 and they are basically the declaration R value references and they are new to C++11. Secondly, non-constant L value reference binds to an object and thirdly, R value reference binds to a temporary object which typically will not be used again. So these three points actually summarize all the concepts we have been covering for the last 20 minutes. So I guess that's clear to you guys. So that's it with this tutorial. Thank you so much guys for watching and I'll see you guys in the next tutorial. Hey guys, what's up? This is Omar Khan. I welcome you to another tutorial in which we are discussing actually about the new features that were added in C++11. So in this tutorial, we are going to be learning about automatic type declaration and the declaration type. So basically type inference refers to automatic deduction of the data type of an expression in a programming language. Now before if you talk uh, before C++11 each data type needs to be explicitly declared at compile time that actually limit the values of an expression at runtime but after the new version of C++ many keywords are included which allows a programmer to leave the type deduction to the compiler itself. Now with type inference capabilities, we can spend less time having to write out things the compiler already knows. As all the types are deduced in compiler phase only, the time for compilation increases slightly but it does not affect the runtime of the program. Now before moving on, to the automatic type declaration you need to first know the use of auto keyword and the normal declaration type and at the end we are going to see an example in which we are going to see that how these two are implemented together. So let's start on with the auto keyword. The auto keyword basically specifies that the type of the variable that is being declared will be automatically deducted from its initializer. In case of functions, if their return type is auto, then that will be evaluated by return time expressions at runtime. So let me just show you a C++ program to demonstrate the working of auto and the type inference. So I will just move on to my compiler right in here. And what we are going to do in here that we are going to write in a very simple program in which we will have two auto variables. First one is going to be auto x. That is going to be equal to let's say one. And then we have a second variable let's say auto y. And that is going to be equal to let's say two. Now we are also going to have a pointer variable. We are going to make it equal to pointer and we are going to make it point towards this very first variable that is right in here x so we are going to write in x over here and what we are going to do is that we are going to see out the type id x dot name that is a built-in function and similarly we are going to do it for the other three as well so we are going to write in type id then we are going to write in y dot name and similarly for the third variable as well that is a pointer basically so we are going to write in type id we are going to write in ptr dot name and finally end l now if we just run this code So finally before running this code, we are going to add a library for this type id as well because it is going to also generate an error and that library is basically we are going to write in hash into loop. And the name of the library is bits that is a standard C++ header file. So it is going to be std C++ dot h and it's going to have this bits as well so i guess it's complete now so long, now let's just run this code so you can see right in here that first we have 
I write in here, then again we have an I, and then finally we have PI as an output. So in here we have basically used the type ID for getting the type of the variables. Type ID is basically an, a simple operator which is used where a dynamic type of an object needs to be known. Type ID X dot name, that is the first one, right in here. It is basically going to return the shorthand name of the data type of X. For example, it return I for integers, D for doubles, Pi for the pointer to integer at a cipher. But actually, name is returned that is mostly compiler dependent. So I guess that is clear. So let me give you a one more example in which we are going to see the use of auto to avoid long initializations when creating iterators for containers. So we are going to remove this stuff from here. And again, we are going to be needing this library that is bits standard C++ header file. And now what we are going to do basically is that we are going to create a set of strings. And we are going to create an object, let's say A for this. All right. Now what we need to do is that we need to basically insert data into it. So using this A, what we are going to do is that we are going to call in the insert function. And after calling this insert function, what we are going to do is that we are going to insert data into it. So what is going to be the data? We are going to insert multiple data elements into it. For example, the first one is my name. Then let's say it has my second name. And then let's say it say tutorials. And I guess that's it. So colon right here at the end. So now what we are going to do is that basically this pointer A, it is going to evaluate I trigger two set of string type automatically. So what we are going to do basically is we are going to use the for loop and what we are going to do is that we are going to use the auto keyword which is going to help us to evaluate to I trigger to a set of string that is present right in here which we have inserted the three elements that is Omer, Han and then tutorials and what we are going to do with this is that we are going to create one more element that is b a dot begin which means that it is going to start from here which means that it is going to take in from the very start and what it's going to do is going to iterate till the very end so it is going to be until and unless this b right in here it is not equal to a dot end so what it's going to do is that it's going to keep adding it, incrementing this one. And then in this for loop, what we are going to do is that we are going to simply see out the steric, which means the pointer of this object B. All right, so let's just finally write and return zero. And I guess let's just run this code. So you can see that it says Khan, then it says Omer, and then it says tutorials. So this is how basically the auto keyword is going to help us when using long initialization. And it's going to actually avoid the long initialization when we are creating the iterators for containers so let's move on to our slides and the next thing we are going to see is a normal declaration type so the decl type keyword is used for that purpose it basically inspects the declare type of an entity or the type of an expression the auto lets you declare a variable with particular type whereas this type that is the DECL type also known as declaration type it lets you extract the type from the variable so declaration type is basically a sort of an operator that evaluates the type of past expression so let me just explain this and its uses with the help of an example so let me just demonstrate a C++ program to use 
DECL type in your code. So what we are going to do is that we are going to first remove this stuff from here. We are going to be needing this library that is bits standard C++.h and what we are going to now do is that we are going to first initialize two functions right here at the top and then using DECL type what we are going to do is that we are basically going to use those functions and using the type ID operator as in the previous tutorial we are going to return the type ID dot name of those function variables. So first we are going to initialize in two variables first function has a return type of integer and let's say the name of the function is a and talk about the body of this function what it's going to do it is going to return simply a variable let's say 2 since it is an integer function so let's say the second function is a character function and its name is let's say b and since it is a character function so it's also going to return a character so we are going to write in let's say it's return g so now in the main function what we are going to do is right here first we are going to create actually the variables for those using the declaration type which we did using the auto keyword in the previous previous part so we are going to write in a and then we are going to let's say name it as x as we did in the previous tutorial and then we are going to do the same for the second one that is the function b and let's name it as y and now what we are going to do is that we are going to see out it in this very same manner the way we did it in the previous tutorial type id x dot name and similarly see out type id y dot name and a space of line so writing this return zero let's just run this code So you can see that it says inc and it has the very same logic as was for the previous case. So let me just give you one more example to demonstrate the use of declaration type and for that we will just remove it and in this example we are going to remain simple and be out of the this stuff of functions. So what we are going to do is that we are going to initialize a normal variable x equal to let's say 2. And now what we are going to do is that we are basically going to use the DECL type for this variable x that has been initialized we are going to write in the name of the variable right in here that is let's say a this time and what we are going to do is that we are going to actually increment the value of x let's say we want to increment it by 2 so now what we are going to do is that if we now see out the type id of a dot name and write and return zero and run this code then in the output you are going to see this i variable so this is basically the reference towards the pointer that is basically printed out by this type id variable and i've already explained what this type id does so i guess that's clear about declaration type as well we have already covered an example so now let's move on to automatic type declaration that is basically let you can call it actually a combination of auto and decl type so to discuss the relationship between auto and declaration type auto and declaration type basically serve different purposes so they don't map one to one auto is a keyword in c 11 and later that is used for automatic type deduction the declaration type specifier yields the type of a specified expression unlike auto that deduces types based on values being assigned to the variable DECL type deduces the type from an expression passed to it. The value returned by declaration type can directly be used to define another variable. Now auto follows the rule of template parameter deduction. While declaration type 
has rules it should follow defined in the standard. For example, if you consider the size of operator, then similar to that size of operator, the operand of the declaration type is unevaluated. Informally, the type returned by the declaration type is reduced using some rules. The first one is that if the expression E refers to a variable in local or namespace scope, then a static element variable or a function parameter, then the result is that variables or parameters declared type. Secondly, if E is a function call or an overloaded operator invocation, the declaration type for that variable E donates the declared return type of that function. Otherwise, the third rule that is followed is that if E is an L value, then the declaration type for E is a template address where template is the type of E. If E is an R value, the result is the template. Now these semantics were basically designed to fulfill the needs of generic library writer while at the same time being intuitive for novice programmers because the return type of declaration type always matches the type of the object or function exactly as declared in the source code. More formally, the rule one applies to unparenthized ID expressions and class members excess expressions for function calls. The deduce type is the return type of the statically chosen function as determined by the rules for overload resolution. So now let me give you a very quick example of how auto and declaration type are used together. So we will define a C++ template function that is going to return the minimum of two numbers. The two numbers can be of any integral type. The return type is determined using the type of minimum of sets. So let's just code it. So I will move on to my compiler. We will remove this stuff from here and as in the previous cases we are also going to be needing this library so the first thing we need to do above this main function is that we have to create a template using the template keyword you've already covered template in the previous section so you have an idea of how templates actually work so we are going to define into class a and then a class b and right down here what we are going to do using this template is that we are going to create a function that is the minimum function in which we are going to as I told you that it is going to return the minimum value for class A it is going to be A A which means a variable A of the data type A then for the class B what we are going to do is that we are going to initialize a variable B now this was basically the job of auto to declare those two variables so now what declaration type over here is going to do is we are going to write in declaration type and this basically is going to check for the condition that is a is less than b then if it is then what it's going to do is that it's going to check it using the if else conditions and then in the body of the function what we are going to do is that we are going to return a is less than b and we are also going to specify the if else right in here so to talk about the driver code that is the main function code what we are going to do in here is that we are going to see out whatever result is returned from the above function and first what we are going to do is that we are going to pass in two values to that function that is the minimum function so we are going to let's say call in the function and pass in let's say the first value is an integer value and let's say the second value is a float value now you're going to add an line space now what it's going to do basically is since we have used templates so you know from your previous knowledge that this a can be of any data type this b can be of any data type so this 3 we passed in was an integer and this 4.5 passed in was a float it doesn't care whatever the value was sent to is because it is to receive any kind of data value since it is a template. Now if we just write and return 0 over here and run this code it is this function over here is going to return the minimum value in this case. So let's just run it 
and you can see that it printed out three which is our minimum value in this case so this is how basically you can use the auto keyword and the declaration type in a single function that is also called automatic type declaration so that's it with this tutorial in the next tutorial we will cover more features that were added in c 11 so up till now thank you so much guys for watching and i'll see you guys in the next tutorial hey guys what's up this is umar khan and i welcome you to a new section here on this course on advanced c in which we are going to be seeing the new features that are added in c 11. so the content covered in this tutorials are basically the additions that are made to c 11. these additions are lambda expressions automatic type declaration and declaration type uniform initializations deleted and defaulted functions null pointer delegating constructors r value references and new smart pointer classes so we are going to be seeing all of these and we'll start on with the introduction tutorial in the next tutorial so that's it with this tutorial thank you so much guys for watching and i will see you guys in the next tutorial hey guys what's up this is umar khan and i welcome you to the very first tutorial on user defined literals in this tutorial we will cover the introduction to user defined literals we will see the syntax for how it is written and then finally when we will see some examples for how it is done in c so what is a user defined literal and what is its use in programming language so moving on to the definition user defined literals are a unique feature in all mainstream programming languages they empower you to combine values with units let me just show you a simple example to help you understand this definition so i will move on to my editor right here and i don't want to output anything i just want to show you that what have i actually spoken in the definition here so for example you have something like a long double and then you have weight and you have initialized it to 2.3 let's say now what is it is it in pounds is it in kilograms or is it in grams this 2.3 so with the user defined literals we can attach units to the values which has some advantages number one the code becomes readable and number two that the convergent computations are done at the compile time so if weight equals to 2.3 kgs for example if we have like weight equals to 2.3 kg and for example we want to compute some uh, kind of ratio that is 2.3 kg divided by 1.2 lb now to compute this ratio actually it is necessary to convert 2.3 and 1.2 into a same unit now this is where user defined literals come into help user defined literals help us to overcome unit translation cost we can define user defined literals for user defined types and new form of literals for built in types they help to make constraints in code more readable the value of a udl or user defined literal is substituted with the actual value defined in the code by the compiler at the compile time user defined literals don't save much of our coding time but more and more calculations can be shifted to compile time for a faster and a safer execution so i hope that you have now understood what is the definition and what is the advantage of using the user defined literals so moving ahead so moving ahead to the syntax now you can see right here that you have the syntax right on your screens that is first a built-in literals then a plus plus means concatenation sign then we have this underscore right here and then we have the suffix right here now if i just show you that how this syntax is actually implemented you can see some of the examples right here the first one is some binary values then we have an underscore this is actually the built-in literal as I showed you right here this is the built-in literal which is this 1011 and then we have this underscore these plus plus shows that this is concatenated actually these plus plus don't have to be added when you are writing and finally we have this B 
which means binary and this is actually the suffix that defined actually this for example in the previous case of weight you can uh, write in as something like let me just show you you can write it as 2.3 underscore kg and this is this 2.3 actually is going to be your built-in literal and then this is going to be the underscore sign and this kg which is actually defining this weight that what what is it this weight in actually in kgs in grams or whatever so this is actually defining this weight so this is the suffix for that and you can see uh, two more examples 63 and then for example we say that it stand as stand for seconds or something like that and then we have 58 and then underscore and cent is the syntax sorry not the syntax it's a suffix actually so this is actually the syntax and these examples define how this syntax is going to be implemented in your code now what is the key benefit of a user defined literal the c++ compiler maps the user defined literals to the corresponding literal operator this literal operator has of course to be implemented by the programmer now to talk about the magic in this case let's have a look at the very first user defined literal that is right here that is 10110101 underscore b that for sure represent a binary value now the compiler maps the user defined literals to the literal operators underscore b which means a long long integer binary value now a few special rules are still missing there has to be a space between the quotation marks and the underscore with the suffix underscore b now you have the binary values in the variable bin now if the compiler does not find the corresponding literal operator the compilation is going to fail now in c plus plus 14 an alternate syntax is used for user defined literals they differ from the c plus plus 11 syntax because it requires no space therefore it is possible to use reserved keyword like underscore capital C as suffix and use a user defined literal of the form 11 underscore C. Now the compiler will map 11 underscore C to the literal operator that is underscore C, which is an unsigned long long integer. Now the simple rule is now that you can use suffixes starting with an upper letter. So finally, now let's move on to Dev C and cover some examples. So here is my dev C++. So let me just zoom it so that it is much more visible. Yep, seems to be good enough. So now let's first solve an example that is exactly related to something like this weight on stuff. So outside this main function, actually paste it again. As I was telling you there that this has to be defined as kg and when ratio of this and this has to be found then these two needs to be in the same unit now this is what user defined literal is going to do for me so this is actually going to be defined in the main function right up here but not like this actually we are going to uh, do it in a pattern but first you need to actually define here that what is going to return what for example if you're talking about kilogram then what is going to return if you are talking about grams then what is going to re return if you're talking about for example milligrams then what is going to return so first you have to define that values and this has to be made right above this main function so that they are global to the main function then it can be used anywhere in your code so for example the first one is long double operator and let's say we are talking about underscore kg and what it's going to return is sorry what it's going to receive is a long double x and then what it's going to do with that long double x is it is going to receive here it is going to actually return x steric thousand which means so whatever this value is going to be received is going to be in kgs so what it's going to do is that it's going to return and turn it into grams first so multiplying your weight in kgs by thousand is going to return it or convert it into grams and this is what this long double operator function not ln it's going to be long so this this is what this long double operator underscore kg function is going to return it's going to return the value in grams actually but 
this long double x was actually in kg since as i told you that this actually defines what value is going to be received so whenever you enter a value in kg this function is going to be called this value is going to be received which means since this function is called so this value has to be in kgs and it's going to return the value after converting it into grams so moving on to now the second function that we are going to define for grams for example we say that the value that was entered was in grams so for that purpose we are also going to define a long double underscore g which means grams and it is also going to be received in long double x which means that if we specify this underscore g with some values then this function is going to be called and when this underscore g is called which means that this x is going to be equal to a value in some grams so what it's going to do is going to simply return the value of x which means it's going to do nothing with that value since what we want is that we want every value to be converted into grams before performing any computations with it so when it is in grams we don't need to do anything with it so for the final one for example we have a value long double operator and underscore mg which means that the value is now in milligrams and what is in milligrams whatever that is received here in this argument so what it's going to do is that it's going to convert it into grams and return it so how it is going to convert it you know the formula for that x divided by 1000 is going to convert that value and it is going to be returned so now after all this is done we have every kind of value converted into the unit we want we have converted every value into gram so now we can actually define our main function right down here so in the main function we can now perform any kind of computation for example we have a long double weight that is equal to 3.6 underscore kg which means that the weight is in kg second what it's going to do is let me just see out this weight then what we are going to do is that we are actually going to set the precision let's just see out the precise result using the set precision function and the set precision is going to be 8 And we are going to write in weight plus 2.3 whatever the weight is it's going to add 2.3 milligrams into it and finish that function as well so next what we need to do is that we need to actually find some ratios now so for example we want first uh, to divide something like 32.3 3 underscore kg and we want to divide it by 2.0 let's say gram underscore g and finally end up so now what it's going to do is that kg is going to be converted into grams this is going to be remain in the very same unit and this computation is going to be performed let's perform one more computation and let's just perform a multiplication of Two values let's say the first one is 32.3 underscore milligram this time and we want to multiply it with 2.0 underscore gram and finally we are going to write in return zero so if I now just run this code you will understand what is going on in here all right, the error says that set precision was not declared in scope. Yes, we did not declare it. And to declare it, actually, we have to include one more library that is named as IOMANIP. Now, this library you have to include when you want to actually call this function set precision. So, this set precision is actually going to limit this output right here to eight values. And let me just run it and then I'll explain each and every output one by one now you can see right here my output on the screen we've got four outputs 
since we have four C out statements and let's just see all of them one by one. Now you can see that the first output is 3600. You can see right here that the weight entered was 3.6 underscore kg. Now when this weight was C out, you know that when this underscore kg is used, actually this function right above at the top is going to be called and you know that this x is now in kgs which means 3.6 kg is going to be received here what it's going to do it's going to multiply 3.6 with 1000 and return this value so when it multiplied 3.6 with 1000 and returned that value that value was actually equal to 3600 that was our first output now to talk about the second output that says set precision 8 weight plus 2.3 mg now weight was actually equal to 3600 gram and this 2.3 was divided by 1000 since milligram when called return x by 1000 and x is now 2.3 it is going to be divided by 1000 is going to be added with 3600 and its precision is going to be set to 8 so if you see the output right here it is 3600.0023 so this was our second output and if you talk about this third output it was 32.3 kg which means that 32.3 was multiplied with 1000 it make it equal to i guess 32300 or something like that and this 2.0 was as it is because you know that when gram is passed it is going to simply return this value as it is it was passed so this is going to be divided by 2 and the output is going to be 16150 and similarly when this last computation was performed this 32.3 was divided by 1000 as you can see at this function right here and it was multiplied by 2.0 as it is because it is in grams and we got this output that was 0 0.0646 so this is what is the purpose of user defined literals in c++ this is how they help us to actually define our types of kg grams or something like that convert them into the values we want have one unit for every type so that operations like multiplications division and something like that can become possible so let me just give you one quick example more and then we can quit on with this tutorial so let's just remove this stuff from here and let's just remove this stuff at the top right here as well now you guys if have uh, just a basic knowledge of mathematics then you know that what is actually iota iota are actually the imaginary values now how do you have to use them in your c++ programming language to for example if you are given two values uh, for example let's just initialize these values so then i can speak about them so for example the first complex value is a double value and it is stored in a variable named z and it is equal to 3.0 plus 4.0 underscore i which means that this is actually the iota part of that value and for example we have one more value that is also double and it is stored in a variable named y and that is equal to 2.3 plus 5.0 underscore iota so actually these are our two values in which if you talk about this z this 3 is actually the real part and this 4.0 is actually the imaginary part and if you talk about y this 2.3 is actually the real part and this 5.0 is our imaginary part now if you're, from your basic mathematics knowledge you know that the basic operations that are performed on any two such values that contain a real value and an imaginary value as well so these are addition or you can just multiply those two numbers so for example you want to multiply this z with y then how the compiler is going to interpret this 4.0 underscore iota and this 5.0 underscore iota and how it is going to add this with a real value now this is the place where user defined literals come into place and they are going to define what this iota is actually so what is this iota is actually first let us define that up at the top here and then we can perform the computations so we are going to just define our imaginary literals right here literal values so let's just write in so it is going to be constant expressions 
the type is going to be complex double and then this following the syntax underscore i which means that this function is going to be called whenever it sees an underscore i and this is going to receive a long double value in this d part and then what it's going to do with that value is it's going to return a complex double value using 0, 0.0 comma static casting of that double value that is d so this is actually something uh, like uh, you lambda expressions and these lambda expressions are going to be coming in the future tutorial where i will be explaining what is a lambda function so for now you need to just understand that a static cost of double value d is going to be done and it is going to convert it into that static cost so let's just now perform our operations so the first operation we want to perform is let's say z plus y and then simply end l and the second operation we want to perform is let's say z steric y and end l as well and finally we already have a return zero so let's just run this code Yep, it says complex does not have a name. We again forget to add the library for that. Let's just remove this library and add the complex library that deals with complex number and iota type values. So let's just run it now. And you can see right here that it runs perfectly. We have got our output. The first output is actually, you can see right here that we actually added two numbers that was z plus y so this is actually the output of z plus y and this is the output of z steric y so in case of z plus y 3.0 was added with 2.3 you can see right here that is 5.3 and 4 and 5 the imaginary values were added and it gives us 9 and this is actually uh, the multiplicative inverse type multiplication so you can just sort it out using your multiplication and you can see that the answer is going to be the same because you are not much smarter than your compiler so i guess that's it so now you know the use of user defined literals what is their purpose how they are going to be implemented how these global functions are going to help us in defining the values for our literals that are user defined so i guess that's it so now these are some of the restrictions you have to follow and now user defined literals can work only with the one given in this slide but the return value can be of any type. It uh, can work with constant characters, unsigned long, long double, char constant, w char constant, char 16 constant, char 32 constant. And uh, these are going to be just standard libraries for that purpose. This 16, this underscore t, this 32 actually is serving as the size. So that's why it's from the standard library of size so but yes it can return any other value you have to remember that these are the values udl work with but the return value can be of any type so i guess that's it with this tutorial in the next tutorial we will cover a second topic of some other advanced topic that is going to be not related to user defined literals so that's it with user defined literals so thank you so much guys for watching and i'll see you guys in the next tutorial Hey guys, what's up? This is Omar Khan and I welcome you to a new tutorial here on Advanced C++. And as I told you that in this tutorial, we are going to be starting on with a new topic that is placement new operator in C++. Now placement new is a variation new operator in C++. Normal new operator does two things. It allocates memory and it constructs an object in the allocated memory. Now what placement new operator does that it allow us to separate the above two things that is allocating memory and constructing an object in the allocated memory. In placement new we can pass a pre-allocated memory and constructs an object in the past memory. So now what is the difference between the new and the placement new? Difference number one is that normal new allocates memory in the heap and construct objects there 
whereas using the placement new operator, object construction can be done at a known address. The second difference is that with normal new, it is not known that at which address or memory location the new operator is pointing to, whereas the address or memory location that placement new operator is pointing to is known because it is a memory of a known address. The third difference comes at the deletion. The deallocation is done using delete operation when allocation is done by the new but there is no placement delete but if it is needed one can write it with the help of a destructor which we will be seeing at the end of this tutorial when we will be covering how to delete the memory or you may say the buffer. So this is actually the syntax for uh, doing or you may say using your placement new operator. We have the new operator then address then the type and then the initializer. As we can see that we can specify an address where we want a new object of given type to be constructed. In the address part that is all done and we can just type in the address of our type. Now when to prefer using the placement new operator. As it allow us to construct an object on memory that is already allocated it is required for optimizations as it is faster not to reallocate all the time. There may be cases when it is required to reconstruct an object multiple times. So placement new operator might be more efficient in those cases. So let me just show you an example to illustrate the placement new operator. So let's move on to our compiler. And in here what we can do is that first we need to actually define a buffer because as I told you that the memory is going to be of our choice. We have to specify the address we want to where we want to store any kind of data. So we have to initialize some buffer in which we want to then specify the address of that buffer in which the data is going to be stored. So we are going to write an unsigned character buffer and we are going to specify the size of it as well. So the size of it is going to be equal to int steric2 which means that the size of this buffer is going to be equal to the size of int which is 4 and steric2 means 4 into 2 8 which means that the size of the buffer is going to be equal to 8 blocks. So 8 blocks in the memory are going to be just allocated right here when we write in this code. So the next thing is that we need to use the placement new operator in the buffer and initialize some values. So we are going to write in integer values and they are going to be equal to new then you know that we have to specify the address and the address in this case is going to be this buff that is the buffer which we created and the second thing is that we need to define in the value which we want to store so int3 is going to store in our value so now let's store one more value and let's name it as qint and that is going to equal to new buff is going to be where it is going to be stored and this size of int and int 5 what it's going to do is it is going to actually add this 5 but first it's going to leave 4 spaces means for example if we have 8 blocks let me just show you now for example we have actually a set of 8 blocks that were initialized using this because the size of int is 4 1 2 3 4 and when we multiply it with 2 which means that 1 2 3 4 blocks more has to be created so we have these 8 blocks right here so when we write in int p int equal to new buffer which means this is the buffer right here so what this buffer is going to do is in this buffer we write a new buffer in 3 which means that 3 is going to be stored in this buffer but when we are storing the value of this 5 right here first what we are going to do is that we are going to specify the location and then we are going to write in where we want to actually store it so size of int means that it's going to leave 4 spaces 1 2 3 and these are the 4 spaces actually 1 2 3 4 this space is going to be counted as well because we have not specified that we have filled this so we are going to leave in 4 spaces and then we are going to store 5 in right here so this is how 3 and 5 are going to be stored in the memory Now the next thing is that we have to actually point in some pointers 
at the location we have actually stored so that later on we can just print out our this is not going to be it's going to be buffer so we can just st uh, print out our addresses in that case so it is going to be int steric And for the first one, it is going to be buffer plus zero because the first is this uh, this tree right here. This this p b u f is going to point towards the location where this p int is stored, and it, you know that it is stored at the very first location. So this is going to be equal to b u f plus zero. And for the second one, that is the buffer of q. What we are going to do is that we are going to write an int steric and the buffer name that is bu double f and we are going to add in size of int which means that this second pointer is going to point for example let me just show you it here this p buffer is going to point right in here this p b u double f is going to point right into us this tree because we have written bu f double f plus zero which means the zeroth location and for the q buffer it has to leave the size of 4 and then point right here so q b u double f is going to point right here so now we can just uh, see out our addresses so that you can just see what's going on in here so we are going to write in see out uh, let's just see out the buffer address first buffer address for let's say first we want to the buffer address of the p buffer so it is going to be p b u f and let's align it and secondly we have to just print out the integer so we are going to write in that p integer is whatever was stored in this p int and secondly we have to specify the q buffer as well so we are going to write in c out we are going to just specify p with it as well p buffer address and then we are going to write in q buffer address and in this case, the QBUF is going to be printed out. And finally, we can just print out the integer as well. So Q integer is QInt. Let's just add a line right here to distinguish that what we are talking about so let's just put a dot 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 here so that these two can be just separated from each other so now since you know that we have initialized this 3 and 5 with a pointer so what this p int is going to give us it's not going to give us the integer it's going to give us the p integer address so we're going to write in p integer address here and it is also going to be q integer addresses and finally let's just put a line again and now we can just print out both the integers so c out first integer And this is going to be printed out using the steric. And if you have uh, the concept of pointers, then you know that what is going on in here. Because when is to when we have to just write in uh, the and sign so that we are pointing towards the address, and when we are writing in this steric, then what do we mean? And when something is initialized with a pointer, then removing this steric from this p end and see printing it out on the console screen what is going to print, and just writing in the steric and then 
printing out this pbuf qbuf or pint or qint and what it's going to print so this is all from the knowledge of your pointers topics so you need, need to go through them first if you don't get the concept of pointers because if you don't get the uh, concept of pointers you're not going to understand what's going on in here so we are going to print out the second integer as well so so the second integer is steric qbuf and nl now as you know that uh, this p buffer and q buffer are actually pointing towards this integer 3 and this integer 5 respectively so when we write in steric buf pbuf since this is pointing towards 3 it is going to print out 3 and since this qbuf is pointing towards 5 so this steric qbuf is going to print out 5 for us so let's just run this code and i hope it ran perfectly yes it does so you can see right here that it says that pbu double f address is right here this p integer address is this which as you can see is the very same because the buffer address and the integer address are both pointing towards the same location then the q buffer address is this the q integer address is this because q buff integer address and p buffer address are going to be the same because q integer is stored in the q buffer and then the first integer is 3 and the second integer is 5 so i hope it is clear let me just explain it to you with the help of a diagram which i added so in this diagram actually the example i just covered is, is explained so you can see that this is actually the buffered which initialized using the size of int which is 4 multiplied by 2 which means that you can see here that 4 plus 4 these 8 blocks have been initialized for this buffer so now the first integer was 3 the second integer was 5 now we initialized p buffer to the zeroth location and then this p buffer sorry this is going to be the q buffer I just I guess misread it. It is going to be the Q buffer. The Q buffer is going to be pointing at plus four location, which means that a size of n location is going to be skipped, which means four locations are going to be skipped, and the Q buffer is going to point right in here. The first integer is going to be stored right in here. The second integer is going to be stored right in here. The P buffer, along with a steric sign when C out is going to generate three. The Q buffer with a steric sign when C out is going to generate a five. The first integer a pointer is going to generate an address for this integer. The second pointer in which this integer is stored is going to generate this address for the second integer. And then simply writing in p buffer is going to generate this address. And simply writing in q buffer is going to generate this address. Moreover, the second integer address and this q buffer address is going to be the very same since they are pointing at the same location whereas the q sorry this p buffer address and the first integer address is also going to be the same right in here as for second integer and the q buffer so i guess that is clear so let me just cover one more example so i'll move on to dev c++ and we will just remove this stuff from here So let's just remove it from here and now in this tutorial what we are going to do is that we are going to initialize a value for a variable and then using the new operator what we are going to do is that we are going to change the value of x and then you are going to see the impact that what happens before using the placement of new operator and what happens after using the placement new operator so just before what we are going to do is that we are going to write in a variable named as x and we are going to make it equal to 10. Now the next step is that we are going to actually see out before using placement new operator and L and then what we are going to do is that we are going to see out the variable we are going to write in the variable is x at this time and we are going to see out the address of that as well so we're going to write in the address is and operator and this x right here and an and l so now we are going to use the placement new operator 
So what it's going to do is that let's initialize a new variable. Let's name it uh, since we are talking about integer here because x is an integer. So we are going to initialize it to integer and then we are going to store it in a variable let's say y. So this is going to equal to new. The first thing we need to do is that we need to give this new variable allocation. So what in this tutorial I wanna want that this value should be overridden because I'm going to pass in the address where this x is stored. So we know that this x is stored at this location and x. So what we are going to do is that we are going to pass in and x as the location and then we are going to write in the value which we want to store at that location. So for example 100 is the value we want to store at that location. So now we are going to see out after using placement new operator and now let's just place one more space here so now what we are going to do is that we are going to see out the variable is which is now going to be handed in this case moreover we are going to see out this y actually so we are going to write in memory address is and l and thirdly what we are going to do is that we are also going to see out x address as well so we can write an x address is not just and l it's going to be and x and then an and l now what is this going to specify here is yes we need to add address here as well for y yes we need to add x here as well yep now perfectly fine and a colon right here now what is uh, this uh, these two statements actually going to specify when these two addresses are going to be equal which means that the value has been actually overridden let me just run it for you you can see that before using the placement new operator the variable is 10 and the address is something like e34 and after using the placement new operator the variable is now 100 but the address is the very same because we have placed this 100 at the location of the x and you can see that the x address is also the very same now what happened actually here is that it is now clear that the new value of x is assigned at the address of x with the help of placement new operator this is clear by the fact that the value of this x which is the x address and the memory address are both equal now let me show you this with the help of a diagram finally You can see right here you can see that uh, this was step number one in which we initialized the value of x equal to 10 and this was and x that was f e e 8 address can be anything so then what it happened that in the step number two we initialized a new variable y or you may say mem or any variable you want to initialize it and we initialize it the address of x which means that the new value that is 100 is going to be stored at the location of x at which 10 is already stored so what it's going to do is it is going to remove 10 from there store itself right there so when this x was printed out it printed out 100 the address of x as well as the address of this mem or y variable was also equal which shows that the value has been overridden successfully so that's how placement new operator is actually used in c++ now moving towards the new thing uh, of the placement new operator is how we can delete the allocated memory in this. So the operator delete can only delete the storage located in the heap. So when the placement new is used, delete operator cannot be used to delete the storage. In the case of memory allocation using placement new operator, since it is created in the stack, the compiler knows when to delete it and it will hand it handle the deallocation of the memory automatically if required one can write it with the help of a destructor and how it is done with the help of a destructor let me show you this with the help of an example so let me just move on to my editor 
and just remove this stuff from here. So here the first thing we need to do before doing anything is that we need to declare a buffer. And we have to give it a size, uh, let's say 100 is the size of that buffer. Now before doing anything in this main function what we have to do is that we have to make actually classes in this case because we are going to do this with the help of the constructor and destructor function and why we are using a destructor I've already told you because we cannot use the delete operator directly for the placement new operator. So we will define a class named let's say deletion. This class is going to do a lot but in this case we are going to make it as deletion because the main purpose of using of solving this example is just to show you the deletion operation so we are going to have private members and in the private members we are going to have double re underscore and i am underscore so these are the two variables we are going to have and in the public area we are going to have the constructor as well as the destructor so first thing is going to be the constructor that is going to be named as deletion and it is going to contain some arguments that are going to be the values of the values which we write initialized right here so it is going to be double re equals to zero and double im equals to zero moreover we are also going to write in I am underscore I am so these are going to be something like these are going to be something like default values and these are going to be the past in values so this is going to be the body of the constructor function now in the body of this constructor function what we are going to do is that we are going to simply print out the values so we are going to write in re this And similarly, we are going to print out the other values as, as well. So now we will define our destructor function. So right after this here, we are going to define our destructor function. And you know that uh, a destructor function has a negation sign at the start. Like this. And then we have to mention the name of the class that we are going to use that is the deletion class and then this is our body of the destructor and in this destructor what we are going to do is that we are going to see out the values again So you will understand that by in both the constructor and destructor we have just uh, printed out these values. So down here after the destructor function what we are going to do is that we are going to return the square root of these numbers. So what we are going to write in that we are going to define a function as double. This is going to be the name of the function. And this function we are going to return the square root and you know the square root is going to be something like re steric re added with i am steric i am and then we will have a print function And in this print function, what we are going to print out, that we are going to print out the value of re. And the value of im. So these are going to be our end values that are going to be printed out at the very end. So now moving towards the main function code. We have uh, already initialized our buffer. Let's just remove these spaces from here. All right, good enough. So now 
in this main function what we are going to do is that we have already initialized our buffer on stack now we are going to initialize objects and define the values for actually these two variables that are the re variable and the im variable so what we are going to write and we are going to write in deletion and we are going to make them as pointers since in a case of this because we are pointing towards the location of the buffer so we want the values which we print out so let me just uh, initialize those values first and let's say the values are 4.2 and 5.3 so now why I have used this pointer because I want these values to point at a certain location in this buffer so that's why since they are pointing towards a specific address in this buffer so that's why this has been defined as a pointer this object has been defined as a pointer so whatever the values are they are going to be point towards a specific location in the buffer so that's why they are objects so let's make one more object and it is going to equal to new deletion and now it's time finally to use our object sorry the placement new operator and the placement new operator is going to be used like name of the object is going to be PE and then we are going to write in new and then we are going to specify the location at which we want to store our object and then finally we are going to call in this 2.6 comma 3.9 because these are going to be the second values that are going to be passed in so finally we are now going to be using the object so we are going to write in PC print then we are going to write in pd 0 dot print then pd 1 dot print and then we are going to write in pe print now as you can see right here that the second object that was the deletion pd equals to new deletion 2 this means that these are going to be locations from 0 1 and 2 so that's why we have written as 0 and 1 right in here we have not yet used the second location which we are going to not use because this means two locations and pd0 and pd1 are those two locations so now we have used these objects to call the print function so now we are going to release our objects and calls the destructor and then release the memory so we are going to write in delete pc which is this object right here so after releasing the objects by calling the destructor function and then releasing the memory now we will call the destruct destructor for object pd0 and then we are going to release the memory and we are going to do the very same for pd1 so we are going to write in delete not in this line let's make it in the new line so we are going to write in delete pd now we cannot make an explicit call to the destructor so we are going to write in pe deletion so if I just now run this code first let me just remove these spaces now run this code all right it say SQRT was not declared in the scope yes we need to initialize the libraries for that right here and the library for that is going to be equal to hash include cmath and this is going to just solve our problem so let's now run this code and you can see that it ran perfectly let me just scroll it down so that you can see that what is actually printed out so for the first call you know that when the object was initialized right at the top here the constructor function was called and 4.2 and 
3 were passed in. Then for this 0, 0 and this 0, 0, because PD0 and PD1 were called and you can see that no values were passed in. So you can see right here. The constructors are called two times for first for, for deletion 0 and then for deletion 1 but no values were passed in. So as you can see right here that when no values are passed in the RE and IM are initialized to the values that are default values that we have defined right here as 0 0. So for PD0 and PD1 that these four zeros are present. The first zero is for RE then for IM then again for RE then for IM. These two zeros are for PD0 and these are for PD1. So then after that the deletion PE using the new buffer was called in and the constructor was also called in. So this 2.6 and 3.9 were called in and then when PC print was called in these 5.2 and 5.3 4.2 and 5.3 sorry were called in and then again for PD0 and PD1 these four zeros were printed out and then when PE print was called in is 2.6 and 3.9 were called in and then these are the values down right here that are called in for this deletion function actually deletion PC is going to generate these four values and then deletion PD is going to generate these sorry deletion PC is going to generate these two values deletion PD is going to generate these four values because deletion PD contains PD0 and PD1 so PD0 has these two values then PD1 has these two values and then PE and calling the destructor function deletes 2.6 and 3.9 from the scenes. So to give you a summary of what's going on in here you have clearly seen that here the destruction destructor is explicitly called because here it cannot be packaged within the delete operator because delete will need to release the memory which you do not have here and it cannot be implicit as it is a dynamic process which we want to manage ourselves. So this is how deletion is done using the placement new operator in C++. So let's move ahead. So the next thing is what is segmentation fault? Then the placement new operator should be used with care. The address which is passed can be a reference or a pointer pointing to a valid memory location. It may show error when the address passed is a pointer such as a null pointer, a pointer that is not pointing to any location and it cannot be a void pointer unless it points to some location. So let me give you a simple example of a C++ program to illustrate segmentation fault while using the placement new operator. So let's move on to dev C++ and let's just remove all this stuff from the main function as well as this class right here as well as we don't need cmath as well now so let's just remove it as well so now what we are going to do is that we are going to define a pointer sorry not a pointer a variable that is going to equal to 10 and then what we want is that we want a pointer let's name it as ipt and it is going to contain the address of whatever this value i is stored in this is going to print out the address for us this pointer is actually pointing towards the location for example if you print out this it is going to print out the location where i is stored so this is the pointer that is pointing to that location where this 10 is stored at this time so we are going to define one more pointer let's name it as i1 and this is where the new operator is going to be used sorry not the new operator the placement new operator so we are going to write in new then we are going to write in ipt and we are going to write in int 9 which means that we are overwriting this 10 because ipt is pointing at the location where this i is stored so when we write in ipt which means that the pointer that the address at which this 10 is stored at that address we now want to store 9. So if we now talk about this, this is actually correct. So we are going to write in correct here because this was a variable i that stores 10 
then we initialize a pointer that pointed towards the location of where this i is store and then we initialize one more pointer and using that pointer we used actually the placement new operator in which in the location part we specified that pointer which was pointing where this i was stored so now at this time this 9 is going to actually replace this 10 so this is a completely fine practice but now to talk about the incorrect method that is going to generate a segmentation fault for us what is that going to be it's going to be incorrect as the ip may not be a valid address for example if i write in int ip and then i write in int second pointer i2 and i'll make it as new ip and int 4 so now as you can see that in this case this ipt was pointing at a location but now this is simply a pointer pointing to no location if you write in something like here and of i then it is going to be perfectly fine but in this case when this is not here and a colon is placed right here this means that this is a simple pointer not a location this is a pointing device but it is not pointing to some location as I told you before that the errors can be generated if a pointer is a null pointer a pointer is not pointing to any location and it can be a void pointer until and unless it points to some location so in this case we have this pointer IP but it may not be a valid address because it is a pointing device but it is not pointing to some location as in this case this IPT was pointing at a certain location where this 10 is stored so using this IP as a location to store this 4 is going to generate a segmentation fault so if I just run this code you can see that it ran does not generate any error but if you can just see something right here something interesting if I print it out let's say IPT in this case since it is used as a location and then I print out C out IP since it is also the location not a location in this case it is a pointer it is not a location as I told you since this is incorrect if I just run it you can see the difference you can see right here that this IPT which was pointing at I location the address has been printed out but secondly you can see that nothing has been printed because there is no such location so this is an incorrect method in, the, in this case so now to talk about the second fault that can be here is right here so the correct method and then we are going to write in incorrect method all right to talk about the correct method let's just suppose that we have void pointer let's say vd and it is equal to and of i which means this very i in which 10 is stored and then we write in int steric i3 equals to new vd the pointer and we store in a value let's say 12 so this is completely okay since this is a white pointer but it is pointing to a location so this i3 is going to store this 12 sorry this i3 is going to point at the location where this 12 is stored and this is going to this vd is going to be the location in this case so if we just see out this vd or yes and write in endl and run this code this was the address problem number previous part and this was not generated because of i guess this let's just remove it from here and now run it you can see right here that the address has been printed out so now to talk about the incorrect method let's suppose that we have a variable let's say int a and we write in int the fifth pointer and we say that it is equal to new 
this a and we want to store a value let's say sex so now it is not a valid address as well since this a is actually nothing it's simply a variable that also need a memory so we cannot write in something like this if we use it something like this when int i equals to 10 and then we write it in steric ipt we need a pointer that point at the location of this then we can use this for example i'm talking that if we write in in steric let's say z equals to and of a and then we use not this a again this pointer actually if we write in this z here then it is going to be perfectly all right but in this case since we have this scenario this is completely wrong so if we just print out c out a since we are defining it as a location you can see that it is straight away generated an error so not allowed so let's just this remove this incorrect method from here as well so this is what segmentation fault is these are the two correct methods and if i just control z this and this is the second incorrect method so i guess that is clear so that was how segmentation fault can occur in your code so now moving towards the end slides now what are the advantages and this what disadvantages of using the placement new operator now the first is that the address of memory allocation is known beforehand which means that this is quite a big advantage of the placement new operator now the placement new operator is useful when, when building a memory pool a garbage collector or simply when performance and exception safety are paramount which is again counted as an advantage of the placement new operator moreover there is no danger of allocation failure since the memory has already been allocated and constructing an object on a pre-allocated memory buffer takes very less time which means not only this is time efficient but moreover the allocation failure in the memory does not occur which is which are both the advantages of using the placement new operator and moreover this feature becomes useful by working in an environment with limited sources so these are very handy advantages i guess i discussed four advantages or five advantages and these are all the advantages of using the placement new operator over the new operator because these are all the disadvantages in new operator because the memory is not known beforehand we do not have a memory pool we have a danger of allocation memory since the allo allocation memory has not been yet allocated and the allocation on the memory that is not allocated takes a lot of time and this feature is not useful when we have limited resources because the new operator cannot be used when we have limited resources so using the placement new operator these five advantages come into hand so i guess you know now what is the purpose of placement new operator how to create one how to use one how to define memory how to delete one what is segmentation fault and what are the advantages of placement new operator over the new operator so that's it with this tutorial thank you so much guys for watching and i'll see you guys in the next tutorial where we will be discussing about a new dimension of a topic so bye bye till then hey guys what's up this is umar khan and i welcome you to a very new topic here in this section of advanced c plus plus and in this tutorial we are going to be studying the copy and swap idiom now before studying the copy and swap idiom what we are going to do is that we are going to study about the normal overloaded assignment operator and then we are going to study the drawbacks that occur in the overloaded assignment operator and then we are going to see that how these drawbacks are going to be solved by the copy and swap idiom so let me just show you an example of the use of the normal assignment overloaded assignment operator and you can see right here that we have an example already solved and in this example actually we are using the normal overloaded assignment operator so in this tutorial in, the, in this example as you can see right here that we have this two integer one is uh, an integer value and one is an integer pointer 
and then we have uh, these uh, public constructors this is the first construct constructor that is actually the initializer list in which we have made s equal to zero size as then the ptr size is going to equal to the new in size and that's points corresponds towards the null pointer then we have this which is the copy constructor in this case and it is going to equal to an object of the constructor class and again the ptr size is going to equal to the new in size and it's going to correspond to a null pointer and in this constructor function that is actually the copy constructor function this over here is the construct copy constructor for constructor function so in this copy constructor what we are going to do is that we are going to call in the memory move function now what is the purpose of the memory move function the memory move function in c++ is actually used to copy a specified byte of data from the source to the destination now to talk about the parameter is it has three parameters actually the first one is the destination that is the pointer to the memory location where the content are copy to then we have the second one that is the source and it is from where that pointer to the memory location where the contents are copied from and then we have the third argument that is the count where we see the number of bytes to copy from the source to the destination so you can see right here that this is actually the destination this is actually the source and finally this size steric size of int is the number of bytes that are going to be copied from this source where this ptr is pointing towards this destination where this object dot ptr is pointed which is right here so then we have this xnr operator in which actually our main job is done so what is our main job in this case is that we are to actually call the overloaded assignment operator and that's where our overloaded assignment operator is being used so in this case this is the x and operator that is equal to the constant x and object which means that the operator address operator is equal to the address of the object where is the object is pointing where our data is actually copied so what we are going to check is that if this and what is this you already know what is this from our basic from your basic concepts that this is actually going to be the pointer that is actually the recent pointer so we say that if this is not equal to the location where this new memory is copied in so what we are going to do is that we are going to delete in the pointer the size is going to be equal to the object dot size the ptr is going to be size equal to new in size and it is going to correspond to an l pointer the memory move function is going to be called and the ptr is going to be the source object dot ptr is going to be the destination and the size direct size of int is going to be the number of bytes that are going to be copied and it, what it is going to do is that it's going to simply return this and this is then going to be our destructor function if you want to use it so if we just run this code you can see that it just ran perfectly now before going ahead you can see that the above assignment operator does two things the first one is that it does the self assignment check and where is this this is actually the self assignment check in which it checks that if the recent pointer is not equal to the memory in which the contents are to be copied so the second thing is going to check is if their assignment is not to self then it do three things it deallocates the memory assigned to the pointer it allocates new memory to the pointer and copying the values and finally it return the recent object that is this object that points to the very current location so now to talk about the drawbacks of the above approach the first drawback is the self assignment check as i told you the self allocation is done very rarely so the self assignment check is not relevant in most of the scenarios this just slows down our code the second drawback of the above approach is the memory deallocation and allocation as it can be seen that first the memory is deallocated leaving the pointer dangling and then the new chunk of memory is allocated now if due to some reason the memory is not allocated and an exception is thrown then the this pointer will be left dangling pointer to a deallocated memory this scenario should be either the assignment is successful or the object 
should not be altered at all. Now this is where the job of the copy and swap idiom comes into account. This approach elegantly solves the above issues and also provide a scope for the code reusability. Now let us see how this is done. So we will just modify the code we already have here in our dev C++. So let's just scroll above and this job is going to be the very same because this is the initializer function and then this is our function in which actually our constructor function actually in which our constructor's jobs are done because this is the copy constructor uh, constructor in which our copying is done so this is going to be the same so right after this we are going to be using the swap function so the swap function looks something like friend white swap and why i've added this swap i will just explain in a moment and then the swap function takes in two objects actually and it takes in actually the pointers towards that object and it stores them here in as addresses so these addresses are then going to you be used to swap the object sizes as well as the object pointers and when you swap the object sizes and the object pointers then this is going to actually swap your values so we are going to write an x and object one so this is object one and then we have x and object 2. Now using these two objects what we are going to do is that we are going to swap object 1 size with object 2 size colon after this and what we are going to do next is that we are going to swap the pointers as well. So we are going to write an object 1.ptr with object 2.ptr. Good enough. So let's just place a call in here. And now in the overloaded assignment operator, the argument passed by values will call the copy constructor. So write in here, in this xn operator equals to const x and j. We are going to just remove this set of statements and this is actually going to call our friend function. So but before calling this friend function we need to just remove it and modify it as x object because we no, no more need a memory. We just need this obj that is actually printing out our memory part. So if we just call our swap function because this is going to call our friend function and this is going to call it using the current object where our where our pointer recent pointer is actually pointing at so this that that is going to be the memory where we are going to start from and we are going to copy this with obj at the location that is the destination location actually where we want to copy our memory and finally we are going to return this so that's i guess perfectly fine now and then we have this constructor function as usual so i guess that's cool enough so let me just run it now so it ran perfectly so now the memories have been swapped actually and that's where our copy and constructor function comes into hand now in the above example the parameter to the object are passed by values which calls the copy constructor to create the object local to the operator of the x class and then the value of the temp object is swapped with the this object that is the left hand side of the assignment operator call. Now what are the advantages of using the copy and swap idiom? The first advantage is that no more self assignment check is needed as the parameter is passed by value. This means that no more memory, memory deallocation is needed. Moreover, a self allocation is very rare, so the overhead of copying in case of self assignment should not be a problem anymore. The second advantage is that now, as copy constructor is used to create the temp object, therefore, the swapping will only be done if the temp object is at all created. Basically, what we were doing manually there, the compiler is going to do it for us in here. 
The third one is the code reusability as I told you as we can see the operator does not have much code in its body rather we are using the copy constructor and swap function to do the job as if I just show you again you can see right here that we are again and again calling the swap function and we are actually using the code again and again which is actually a case of code reusability so I guess that's it with copy and swap idiom now you know that what are the advantages of using a copy and swap idiom over a normal overloaded assignment operator so that's it with this tutorial in the next tutorial we are going to be starting a very new topic as in this section we are in every tutorial covering a new topic so in the next tutorial you will be seeing a new topic so that's it with copy and swap idiom thank you so much guys for watching and i'll see you guys in the next tutorial hey guys what's up this is umar khan and i welcome you to another tutorial in this section on advanced c so in this tutorial we are going to be covering a new topic that is lambda expressions now lambda expressions in c were introduced in c 11 to allow us to write an inline function which can be used for short snippets of code that are not going to be reused and not worth naming. In its simplest form, lambda expressions can be expressed as shown onto you in the syntax on your screens. You can see that it has a capture clause, then the parameters, then you have to specify the return type, and finally you have to define the definition of the method. Generally, the return type in lambda functions are evaluated by the compiler itself and we don't need to specify that explicitly. And the return type part can be ignored but in some complex case, as in conditional statements, compiler can't make out the return type and they need to specify that. Now, various uses of lambda expressions with standard functions can be explained with the help of an example. So let's just move on to a compiler here we are so the example i'm about to solve is going to be containing se several parts the first part is that we are going to initialize a vector and then we are going to simply print it out using the lambda expressions secondly we will select a specific number from that vector and we will see the first occurrence of that number when it is greater than some number then we are going to sort that vector as well using lambda expressions then we are going to select a specific number and see that from how many number that number is greater the next we are going to just remove that redundant elements from that vector again then we are going to be calculating the factorial of a number using lambda expressions and finally we will find the square of a number using the lambda expression so it is going to be a very comprehensive example in which you will see all the uses of lambda expressions and i've covered all these scenarios because lambda expression is a very 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 important topic so the first thing we need to do is that we need to initialize a vector it is going to be an integer vector whose name is going to be v and it is going to be equal to a set of numbers, let's say 4, 1, 3, 5, 2, 3, 1, 7, 4. I guess that's enough. So this is going to be a vector in and this vector we are going to first print it out. So the first thing we need to do is that we need to define a function here that is going to simply print out all the elements in that vector using the lambda expression for sure. So the vector is going to be print vector and it's going to be a void function and in the argument it is actually going to receive that vector that has the name v and then what we are going to do is that we are going to use now lambda expression to print out the elements of that vector. So we are going to use in for each loop for that purpose and then we are going to write in v dot begin. v dot end and these are the expressions that were always used and finally int i so now in the body of that what we are going to do is that we are going to simply write in c out i so it is going to actually print out the elements for us 
So what actually is going on in here in this lambda expression is that we have actually used a for each loop and in that for each loop we have actually written v.begin which you know that it is going to actually grab the beginning of the vector which we have passed in right here and print start from the very first element v.end is going to iterate it to the till the end loop and then int i in int i every time it is going to contain only one element so for this for each loop when it begins when this v.begin is called it store the very first element that is 4 right in here and it come into this loop print out this 4 for us went back check for the next element which was not v.end since this is the ending criteria for this for each loop so the next element that was stored in this int i would be this 1 then 3 then 5 then 2 and so on till 4 when this v.end which is going to be this last element is going to stop this and the loop is going to stop so let's just run this code all right it i guess a vector was not declared in the scope we have to include i guess a library for that purpose that is hash include This is the library for that and one more thing we need to do right here is that we have to write an std so i guess that's good enough it's going to now run perfectly all right we have one more that says expected this yep i guess yes this this bracket don't need to be put here because for the for each loop this bracket has to be Put after this body and a colon right here this this is actually the ending bracket for this this ending bracket right here is for this int i and this is right for this this is how lambda expressions work on so I guess that's good enough so let's just run this code now and I think it's going to work perfectly fine now and yes it ran perfectly all we need to now do is that in the main function we have to just call this print function so that it just generates some output for us so we are going to write in print vector we need to be in small and what we need to do is that we need to pass in this vector so the name of this vector is right here v we pass it to this function print vector and now this vector int v has actually this vector which we have defined right in here so if we now run this code it is going to just generate an output for us as well so here is my output and as you can see that I have got all the elements that are 4, 1, 3 up till this 4. So this is how elements of a simple vector that are initialized in a sequence and then printed out in a sequence as well. So let's just remove this end i from here. Add space here. And I guess that's going to be much more better. Yeah, that seems to be much more better way of presenting our output and just put a one line space here for our second output to find the occurrence of a first element greater than a specific element for example if we just take in this number four then what we are going to see is that we are going to find the first element that is actually greater than this four in this case it is actually five so our output is going to be something like the number that is greater than this 4 in this case it is going to be 5 so now let's just code this so in the main function what we are going to do is that we are going to be using the vector and using that what we are going to do is that we are going to be using an iterator p in which we are going to actually store our element and what we are going to do is that we are going to use in find if and the same conditions we dot begin and we are going to keep iterating until the very end so we are going to write in v and because we want to search for each and every element we want to check our first element for which we want to find a greater number so we want this for it to be checked with each and every number 
so we're going to start from v dot begin and then iterate till v dot end and what we are going to search for is the number so that number is going to be stored in this int i and what we are going to simply do is that we are going to write in i is greater than 4 is going to be returned simple enough and here is where we are going to put in colon let's just put a tab space so that it looks much more like the body part so this iterator p is going to store the value because this find if is going to start from v.begin it's going to iterate till v.end but since we have written in the body that return i is greater than 4 and i in, is in this case is going to be the value we want to check so the value we want to check since i for the first case is 4 so i is going to be 4 so it's going to start looking for this uh, for any element that is greater than 4 so at the first case this 4 was greater than sorry this 5 was greater than this 4 so at the very first instant when it found this it returned it so the rest of this iterator loop was not executed and the first occurrences of any element greater than this was printed out so in here we are going to simply see out first number greater than 4 is steric p and l now you might be thinking that why i have not called this find if function because this is how lambda expressions work i traitor p actually with this variable when i call in like this what it's going to do is that it's going to execute anything with this now what is the purpose of this find if is it a built-in function or is it not yes it is it is a built-in function and what it does is that it is going to search for an element for which any argument which we pass in becomes true since in this case the third argument that this is the zero this is the first this is the second and this is the third argument the third argument returned true so this loop is going to stop so what it's going to print is is going to print that number at which the condition becomes true so in this case the condition becomes true at this five right here so this p is actually going to point at this location so when i write in steric p it is going to print me out that number so if i just run this code yes i have messed the body brackets and this needs to be right in here all right good enough now let's just place it right over here as well so it's going to now work perfectly so you can see right here this is our first output that was printing out the simple vector and then this is my second output that says the first number greater than 4 is 5 so now towards the next part and in the next part what we are going to do is that we are simply going to sort this vector which we have right up here so we are going to sort it up starting from the greatest number and then moving on towards the smallest number so it's going to be sorted something like 7 5 then 4 then 3 and then 2 then 1 something like that so let's just code it as well so we will just code it right behind this so what we are actually going to now do is that we are going to make a function to sort the vector using lambda expression and lambda expression is for actually sorting in the non-decreasing order compiler can make out the return type as bool but we can just make it work our own way so how it is going to be done it is going to be done using sort function that is also built-in function and what it's going to do is it is going to start from the very start that is v.begin and it is going to iterate till v.end and then these are the bracket for the lambda expressions and then in this bracket this time what we are going to do is that we are going to write in constant int and a and constant int and b
and they are going to correspond to a bool value. Now, what is actually going on in here? Let me just code the body first and then I'll tell you what is going on in here. So right before behind this, what we are going to write in, we are going to return A is greater than B. And then this column right here. Now, right above here, what I just told you, that whenever this condition is true, then what it's going to do is that it's going to stop right in here and it's going to return that number for me. So in this case, right down here, this sort function is going to actually sort starting from the very first element till the very last element. And now what is the purpose of these two constant integer addresses actually here? Now these are actually going to store the two values and then if this condition is true which is written a is greater than b since in this case we want the elements to be sorted in the form of decreasing order so if this bool is actually true so what it's going to do is that which means that this is actually going to be true so when this is true this bool is going to be equal to true and the two values are going to be stored right in here and those values are then going to be sorted out using this function when these are not for example some values are always there that don't need to be sorted out for example in this case let's just see this case right here these 4 and 1 don't need to be sorted because 4 is already 4 and 1 all already in the form we want them to be on the output screen there need to be elements in between them but for this case for the first comparison this condition is actually false which means that a is greater than b is false because a at this time is 4 whereas b at this time is 1 so this condition is false so this bool is false so we don't need to store some values in here and perform the sorting function values are stored in there 4 is stored in there 1 is stored in there so that's why they check in using this return a is greater than b but the sort function don't work for such values which are always in sorted form so for values for example 3 and 5 or you may say 1 and 3 such values need to be sorted out so in that case 1 is going to be stored in int a 3 is going to be stored in constant int and b and these are going to be sorted out using this sort function so when this function actually complete from v.begin till v.end then we already have our array sorted out all we need to do is that we need to print it out so how to print it out we have to actually call simply the print vector function and pass in our vector right from here a column right in here and let's just see out as well sort it vector is this print vector v and finally end l so now if I just run this code all right it says some error and this it says no match for greater reference here yep a very silly mistake we can just see out this print vector v because we are not actually returning something from up there so let's just remove this from here or let's just cut it out and we have to simply call in this function and right above here we can just write in this statement sorted vector is and then this print vector v is going to simply print out each and everything for us we don't have to specify c out with a function here that's just silly of me so let's just run it now as you can see right here that we have the sorted vector right here seven five four four three three two one one so you can see that we have this simple vector then we sorted out this using the lambda expression and finally we sorted out our vector using the lambda expressions so now moving towards the next part and in the next part what we are going to see is that we are going to actually count the numbers that are greater than or equal to a specific number so how it is going to be done let's just code it so right down here we are going to initialize a variable named its count because what we want is that we want a count of a number that is 
that is greater than or equal to some specific numbers we want that how many numbers are greater than a specific number so that are going to be stored in this count so we are going to write in count underscore if and then we are going to write in v.begin then v.end then this and finally we are going to write in int a that is actually going to store the number for us and then this is going to be the body and in this body what we are going to do is that we are going to return a is greater than or equal to let's say 5 so the number that we want to check is actually the 5 so write this colon here and write this colon here so one more thing before I run this code that I need to see out the number of elements greater than or equal to 5 r actually whatever the value is of this count well variable now let me just do one more thing before I run this code because the coding is complete just I want to tell you one more thing here now you can be seeing that this count if function this sort function then this find if function we are actually and then finally this function also as well this print vector function all of these are lambda functions so as you can see right here that when I have to use this print vector function I have to actually call it as you can see that I have called it twice once when I was printing simple the vector and secondly right down here when I was actually printing the sorted vector so and I don't call these functions right in here that are the sort function the count if and then the find if function right above here now what is the reason for this because as you can see that this is the main function these functions that are the find a function this sort function and then right at the bottom the quantity function are actually in the sequence of this main function so these don't need to be called they are called by themselves that's why I'm always calling them as built-in function these are not something like built in the library of the C++ they are not because these are actually lambda expressions they are called in by themselves they are executed by themselves that's why they are built in they are not built in the sense that they are something like store in the background of our C++ libraries like we have this int stored we have this return value that that is something like a built-in value that is stored in our C++ libraries and variables or something like that this is something not not like that completely not like that because this find if is a normal function but since it is a lambda expression right here so this don't need to be called when the sequence of execution comes here and it sees that it is actually talking about a lambda expressions so it execute the body of it as itself it don't need to call it but why do we call this function is because this is out of the body of the main function so when we have to use it the sequence of execution don't come here at any stage but it can come here at the stages when we call it so when we call it twice the sequence of execution moves right here and this function is called but if this function was right in between these in the main function we would not have the need to call this function but if we have used it since you know that we have called this function twice so if I just copy it from here and paste it instead of this and also this right here then this is not actually a good programming technique because in C++ or any other programming language code reusability is something so we have to reuse our code so that's why we have written this set of statements which we want to execute again and again it is a lambda expression I'm not saying that it is not a lambda expression it is a lambda expression but they are written right at the top here so that we only have the need to call this function not repeat this entire set of code because that this would not be then a good programming technique so I guess uh, now I need to run it
and you can see right here that the number of elements greater than 5 or equal to 5 are 2 as you can see in this that is the first number and that is the second number these two elements are actually greater than or equal to 5 this 7 is greater than 5 and this 5 is equal to 5 no other number is greater than or equal to 5 so this count was equal to 2 so the next thing in this tutorial that we are going to do is that we are going to make a function for removing duplicates from this very list available that is in the sorted form now so what we are going to do is we are going to do it right here so we are going to write in p equals to unique and we are going to then again write in v.begin we are going to write in v.end and then this is the sign for the lambda expressions and then again since in this we are also talking about comparisons so we need two values that is int a and int b and then we have this body right here and what we are going to do is that we are going to return a equal equals to b and a colon right in here so i guess that's good enough let's just run it now but before i run it this actually just remove our elements so all we need to do is that we need to call our print vector as well and we have to pass in the same v and let's just print out a c out statement at the top here as well that says unique elements in the list are right at in here because since this function it's going to start from the very start it's going to move at the very end and it is going to return the values that are actually equal so when i just run it it's going to print out the unique elements for me so you can see right here that it says that the unique elements in the list are seven five four three two one and then the repeated elements as you can see are put right at the bottom you can see that it first printed out the unique elements for me that is seven five four three two one and after that as you can see if you consider this sequence it has a 4 4 then a 3 3 and then a 2 1 1 but it's in here it looks for this element it has removed this 4 from here it has removed this 3 from here and it has moved it up till here and then finally it has actually concatenated this 2 1 1 right in here so good enough so the next part is how to find the factorial of a number now how to find the factorial of a number actually we have to store all the values into an array first for example if you want to find the factorial of 10 then you need an array that stores elements from 1 to 10 because you can actually not iterate this loop again and again so for that what we need is that we need an array that contains element from 1 to 10 good enough now what we need to do is that we need to actually store it in a value as well so it is going to be equal to let's say the name of the function is factorial well let's just call it fact and it is going to take in the array from 1 to 10 and it is going to start from the very first value and these are then the brackets for the lambda expression and finally we are going to actually store two values int i and int j int i and int j for the very first case is going to store 1 and 2 and what it's going to do with 1 and 2 is that it's going to simply return their product so it's going to multiply them and the next time this 3 is taken into account it is going to multiply this product with this three and at the end our factorial is going to be found so we can just see out factorial of 10 is f so let's just run this code Alright, it says that fact was not declared in the scope. 
all right uh, yes the name of this function has to be accumulate because these are some of the names that we have to use for lambda expressions these names right in here we are begin we dot end then this name of the function named count if these are actually something that we have to use in again and again so then finally we are going to put I guess nothing else let's just run this code and it says the factorial of 10 is something very big value yes it is so you can just find it using your calculator as well and the final thing I told you was how to find actually the square of a number so for that I'm going to write in auto square square and I guess we don't need any spaces in between this and it is going to equal to int i and this int i is actually going to be the value which we are going to pass in ourselves and for the body of this what is going to do is it is going to return i steric i which means that it's going to multiply it with itself which is actually the square because square of the number is multiplication of the number by itself so down here we are going to write in c out square of let's say we want to find the square of six is we will write the name as square and we are going to pass in six and I guess we need a space here as well so now let's just run it all right this don't need to be here now let's just run it and you can see it right here that the square of 6 is 36 which is perfectly correct now this auto here is actually going to automate the square whenever it is called so this i was passed in which was 6 so it returned 6 cross 6 that was 36 which was printed out using this cout statement now a lambda expression can have more power than an ordinary function by having access to variables from the enclosing scope we can capture external variables from enclosing scope using three ways the first one is by using capture by reference then capture by value and then capture by both now the syntax using used for the capture of a variable are some signs for example we can use the and sign that is for capturing all the external variables by reference then if you want to capture by value you have to use the equal to signs that capture all the external variables by value then if you want to capture by both value as well as by reference then you have to write in a normal variable for example let's say x and then a variable after putting a comma sign and of y for example you can write in something like and of x and then sorry not x and then and of y so this is actually going to capture both by reference as well as by value so a lambda with empty capture clauses can access only those variables which are local to it now how this this capturing is actually done so you, if you can see right in here right above in this for example let's say let's talk about this function in which we have actually printed out the number which in this case we were actually talking about the first occurrence of an element which is greater than this 4 so what if we want to talk about some other element for example we want to talk about this 5 and see that where which, which is the occurrence when this element is greater than something so for that what we are going to do is that you have to specify for example let's say int n and we say let's say in n equal to 5 and then in these brackets we have to write in this n 
and in here we are going to write in i is greater than n so this is how we have actually captured a variable so if i just run it now you can see right here that the first number greater than 4 is 7 it is not actually now 4 it is actually now 5 so in the previous case the output was this 5 because we were talking about 4 the first number greater than the 4 was this 5 but the first number now greater than this 5 is actually 7 so now we have actually captured the value that is in between any value in these brackets of the lambda expressions As you can see right in here that now we have the first number greater than 5 is actually this 7 so now to give you one more example if we talk about let's say this count if case in which we were actually counting the number of values that were as greater than a specific number so if we just write in an equal to sign here which means that now we are talking about capture all the external variables by value so when we put this equal to sign in here this denotes that we can access all the variables now it is going to count numbers that are greater than or equal to n actually so let's just run it again now one thing we need to check or stop we are not talking about this unique we are talking about this counter function so we have to put in this equal to here and now we are going to write in a is greater than or equal to n so now we are going to talk about capturing all the values by reference and we are going to actually access all the variables so in this case we have actually accessed this n so now in the previous case it was giving us 2 because the occurrence of the specific value was 2 but now in this case it's n which is 5 so if we just run this code so you can see right here that the number of elements greater than or equal to uh, 5 are actually 2 so actually we have talked about the very same element let's just change it to 6 not 6 because 6 doesn't exist let's just change it to 1 and right here we are also going to change this equal to 1 and now run it So as you can see right here that this value is also changed and you can see right here that the number of elements greater than or equal to 1 are 9 because all the elements are greater than or equal to, to 1. So this generated the total number of elements for us and you can see right here that the first number greater than now it's actually talking about 1. So the first element in our list was 4 which was greater than 1 so it generated this 4 as an output. So this is how we can actually capture some values so we have already solved our examples so one more thing before i sign off from this tutorial is that you need to understand that c plus plus 11 and the versions after the c plus plus 11 only supports lambda expressions if you are working with any compilers that are before that c plus plus 11 and their after versions then they are not going to be compatible with lambda expressions and it, they are not going to run that for you so you need to keep this in mind that when you are running it you have to check the compatibility of your compiler that it is C++11 or the version after it. So thank you so much guys for watching and I'll see you guys in the next tutorial. Hey guys what's up this is Sumer Khan and I welcome you to another tutorial here on this section on advanced C++. So in this tutorial we are going to be starting on with a new topic that is signal handling. Now what are signals? Signals are basically the interrupts that force an operating system to stop its ongoing task and attend the task for which the interrupt has been sent. These interrupts can cause a service in any program of an operating system. Similarly, C++ also offers various signals which it can catch and process in a program. Now, as you can see right here, we have a list of various signals and its operation that C++ pr provides the user to work with. The first one is the signal INT that produces the receipt for an active signal. The second one is the SIGTERM that sends a termination 
request to the program then we have the SIGBUS that is the bus error which indicates access to an invalid address then we have SIGILL that detects an illegal command then we have the SIGALRM this is used by the alarm function to indicate the expiration of a timer then we have some more functions right here that is the SIGABRT that operation is to termination of a program abnormally then we have SIG stop the signal can be blocked cannot blocked handled and ignore and can stop a process then we have SIG SEGV that's operation is to detect invalid access to storage then we have SIG FPE whose operation is to overflow operations or mathematically incorrect operations like divide by zero then finally we have SIG USR1 and SIG USR2 that are actually the user defined signals now we have this signal function the signal function is provided by the signal library and it is used to trap unexpected interrupts or events this is the syntax right here in front of you that is the signal the registered signal is the first argument and that signal handler is the second argument now the first argument is actually an integer and it represents the signal number and the second argument is actually the pointer to the signal handling function we must keep in mind that the signal that we would like to catch must be registered using a signal function and it must be associated with a signal handling function now the signal handling function whenever it is defined it is going to be of white type now let me just show you an example of how this signal function is going to be implemented and how an interrupt is going to be caused and it is going to just stop the flow of a program so I'll we'll just move on to my editor right here and the first thing we need to do is that we need to actually initialize one more library right here that is for signal handling and it is hash include and the name of this library is C signal not in capitals all right so this is actually the library that is the C++ version of the standard C signal.h header and it declares function and macros related to the signal handling library so now in the main function we are actually going to do the calling part but before that main function we are actually going to use our functions so for example we have one function that is named as signal handler and in this signal handler function what we are going to receive is the signal number that is going to cause an interrupt and what we are going to see out is simply we are going to write in interrupt signal and then we are going to print out its number that is the signal number and then we are going to write in received so it is going to simply print out uh, the number that is going to be received and then this is going to end and then what it's going to do is after receiving this signal that it is going to clean up and close up some stuff here and terminate the program so for that we are going to write an exit and signal number is going to identify the signal which we want to exit actually so now down here in this main function we just scroll it down so that it is much visible right in here what we are going to do is that we are going to register the signal using the SIGINT and the signal handler so we are going to call in the signal function the first thing that we need to do in here is that we need to use actually some library from right in here so we are going to use in this signal initializer that is going to produce the receipt for an active signal so if we move back to our dev c++ right in here we are going to write an SIGINT and then we what we are going to do is that we are going to call in signal handler 
and finally what we are going to do is that we are going to actually run a program for example let's say it's while one what it's going to do is that it's going to see out going to sleep and out and it's going to sleep for one second this is actually the time and then finally what we are going to do is that we are going to simply write and write on zero here so now if I just run this code you are going to see something very interesting what's the problem with this it says that sleep was not declared in the scope yes I think I just forget to include the library for that and it is going to be hash include unistd.h this is actually the library to run this sleep function now what is the purpose of actually the sleep function in here it is going to actually print out this going to sleep after one millisecond so now if I just run this code you can see right here that going to sleep going to sleep going to sleep but if I just press in control plus C you can just note it down that you have to press control plus C to actually initiate that function so if I just press in control plus C you can see that this function was actually executed and it exist exited whatever the signal number was so if I just put in the sleep timer here to just show you what happens actually here sleep one now run this code you can see right here that it says going to sleep going to sleep going to sleep but now if I just press control plus C it says that interrupt signal 2 was occurred let's just increase, increase this timer so that it is visible for some time so that I can show you now you can see if I now press control plus C it says interrupt signal 2 received this is actually the signal number that is received so after 6 millisecond the program ended because this condition that says exit signal number to so at it was exited actually so i hope this is clear that how the interrupt signal was actually caught in when we press in control c so now moving ahead so you know now how the signal function work how you have to use the registered signal and signal handler and now the next thing is the raise function the raise function is actually used to generate signals and the syntax for it is very simple you have to write in raise and the signal it, this argument is right as in mentioned in the list so let's just solve an example for how this raise function actually work so let's move on to our editor and we will have the very same program in which we will have this white signal handler in which we will just print out this interrupt signal and then the signal number and then we will also just exit the signal number and let's just decrease the sleep timer to 3 and then right here in this main function what we are going to do is that we are going to initialize a variable that is int i equals to 0 and then what we are going to do is that we are going to in this very same way call in this function and now let's just remove it from here let's just align it a bit and now after calling this function what we are going to do is that now we are going to initialize a while loop that is initialized using plus i i not plus i it's going to be plus plus i and what we are going to do in this function is that we are going to see out going to sleep And now we are going to use an if condition that if i equal equals to 3 what it's going to do is that it's going to raise the signal and what is going to be the signal it is going to be s i g i n t and then a sleep function right in here for one second and then finally our return zero is already here so let's just put away these lines and run this code now as you can see that when the code is executed it produce, produces this output 
and it would come out automatically that the interrupt signal 2 is received because now actually we have raised the signal when i was equal to 3 so it printed out going to sleep three times we don't have to press ctrl plus c this time because what the raise function did was using right in here it raised a signal and initialized that signal so when this function was called in this void signal handler was automatically called in the previous case this signal raise function was called in when we press in control c but now we have actually done it using a code and we have used the raise function for that purpose and write in s i g i and t so when this function is called in when i equal to 3 which means that three times going to sleep after one second is going to be printed first and then it's going to print out interrupt signal to receive and it's going to terminate that program so i guess that is clear so this is how you can just use or you the signal function and this is how you can just use the raise function to actually initialize your signal so these are some of the other functions as well which you can use so you can see the examples of them yourself these are quite easy you have to use them in the very same fashion as i explained this first time right first one right here so i guess that's it with this tutorial thank you so much guys for watching and i'll see you guys in the next tutorial hey guys what's up this is omar khan and i welcome you to another tutorial here on advanced c in this tutorial we are going to be starting on with a new topic that is command line arguments now to tell you anything about this command line argument and what is the purpose of command line arguments in C or C++ you need to know one thing right here now you know that there are many kind of functions you can use in C++ you can use build in function you can use manual function and then we have a function named as main that actually controls the flow of your code so the most important function of a C program or a C++ program is that main function it is mostly defined with a return type of integer and mostly without arguments now we can also give command line arguments in c and c++ command line arguments are given after the name of the program in command line shell of the operating system to pass command line arguments we typically define main with two arguments first argument is the number of command line arguments and second is a list of command line arguments now this is how the syntax actually look like you have the main function then you have two arguments first is the integer a r g c and then we have the character a double point the pointer and then a r g v now if you talk about the first one that is int a r g c this is actually the argument count it is an integer and it stores the number of command line arguments that are passed by the user including the name of the program so if we pass a value to a program value of the argc would be 2 now why it would be 2 because the first value in the argc is going to be for the argument and the second one is going to be for the program name then we have the second argument that is char then steric steric and argv this is actually an argument vector which is an array of character pointers listing all the arguments if argc is greater than zero the array elements from argv0 to argv until argc minus one will contain the pointer to strings now argv0 in every case is going to be the name of the program after which all the arguments are going to be initialized so let me just show you a very simple code and then you can see the difference between these two arguments and how they are actually going to be used so here we are in dev c++ now in the main function what we are going to do is that we are going to pass in two arguments actually right here the first one is going to be argc that is the argument count as i told you and then we have this character steric steric argv that is the argument vector now in this function what we are going to do is that we are going to simply see out and we are going to write in you have entered 
argc which is actually the argument count so it's going to generate as the argument count and then we are going to write in arguments so it is going to be a simple statement that is going to say that you have generated for example let's say if you have two arguments then it's going to say that you have entered two arguments so now what we are going to do in this main function is that we are going to initialize a for loop and in this for loop what we are going to do is that we are going to write in i equals to zero i is less than a r g c and then i plus plus is going to be a colon and it's going to be a pre-argument not a post one so it's going to be plus plus i not i plus plus all right so now in the body of this main function what we are going to do is that we are going to simply see out argv that is our argument vector and here an i and finally what we are going to do is that we are going to write in return zero after this now for example we have two arguments then the value of this i is going to be equal to two because this argc is actually this argument count so if you have two argument this loop is going to be uh, running for i equal to zero and then i equal to one and after that this condition is going to be false because now then two is not less than two because two equal to two so i equal to zero this condition is going to run perfectly and this for loop whatever it is whatever this statement is it is going to be executed and then for i equal to one this statement is again going to be executed and what this statement is actually because as i told you that this argv is actually the argument vector so for two arguments what is going to do is that argv0 and then argv1 is going to be printed out now always remember that argv0 in every case is going to be the name of the program and then argv1 until argc-1 since for two this argc is not going to uh, this condition however here is not going to run because this condition is going to be false so it is going to run until argc minus one so every other value other than i equal to zero until argc minus one is going to be the elements in the argument vector so if you just run this code now all right it is scanning this all right it says you have entered one argument since now we have not called this function because this function is going to be called from your command line and where is that command line actually this command line is actually going to run from your linux machine so if you run this code from your linux machine by entering these coordinates and let me just write you the code for that so that you can just run it so you can write in in your linux machine main return dot cpp minus o means output and then main and then you are going to write in main and then you can write in anything like let's write your name anything else so what it's going to do is that it's going to run your code for you in this case what is the, this omer and this han is going to be the argument which means that we have passed in two arguments to this main function so in this case it is going to generate that you have entered three arguments why it is going to say that you have entered three arguments because first is the name of the program as i told you then this omer is the first first argument and then this is the second argument so zero one two makes equal to three arguments so it is going to generate you have entered three arguments so if you write in something like anything like i am cool so then it's going to say that you have entered four arguments so you can just run it from your linux machine and then you can see that how it is going to run so you have seen uh, this now now other platform dependent formats are also allowed by c and c plus plus standard for example unix and microsoft visual c plus plus have a third argument given as the program's environment otherwise accessible through get env in 
standardlibrary.h. So for that you can refer the C programs. Now to talk about the properties of command line arguments. First property is that they are passed to the main function. They are the parameters or arguments that are supplied to the program when it is invoked. Thirdly, they are used to control the program from outside instead of hard coding those values inside the code. Fourth one is that ARGV ARGC is a null pointer, then ARGV holds the name of the program as I told you, and then ARGV1 until ARGC-1 points to the first command line argument, and then so on until the last argument. So you pause all the command line arguments separated by a space, but if argument itself has a space, then you can pass such arguments by putting them inside double quotes or single quotes. Now to talk about the last thing that is what are the changes in output if you pass in different arguments. For example, if you pass no argument and call it without argument when the above code is compiled and executed without passing an argument, it is going to say that you have entered only one argument and that argument in the, that case is going to be actually the name of the program. As I told you, when I ran that code, if I run it again, You can see right here that it says that you have entered for an argument because we have passed in nothing to this. Now if you pass in three arguments, what it's going to say is that you have passed in four arguments in which the ARGV0 is going to be the name of the program and then ARGV1, ARGV2 and ARGV3 are going to be the first, second and third argument respectively. Similarly if you pass in a single argument then what it's going to say is that it's going to say that you have actually passed in two arguments. The first one is going to be the name of the program that is ARGV0 and ARGV1 is going to be the first argument in this case. Then for example, you want to pass an argument that already has a comma in between, then you can use quotation marks for that purpose. For example, you can quote a larger statement in single quotation marks. For example, you can just write in like, I am da 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 and comma then da da da. So this kind of arguments in which you have a comma in between, you can put them in quotation marks and it is going to treat them as a single argument. So in this case, it is going to also say that you have passed in two arguments. First argument is the name of the program and the second argument is right in here in this quotation marks. So I hope it's clear. So that's it with this tutorial and that's how you can use command line arguments. You can try it in your Linux machine and it's going to run very perfectly and you're going to enjoy it so that's it with this tutorial thank you so much guys for watching and i'll see you guys in the next tutorial